issues that you know we weren't aware of at the time when we started this project. Um, so it's it's both.
they faced uh, recognized officer for bravery displaying the bravery they displayed. They faced significant danger and.
Everybody, sorry, <laughs> I jumped the gun there since we're late. Welcome everyone to the June 6, 2023 Special Redevelopment Agency meeting. Thanks so much for um, your patience as we were delayed a few minutes. Please let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of board member Nadolski, who's asked to be excused. Um, right now, I'll invite uh, Vice Chair Ritchie to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please stand if you're able and join me at the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please join us in a moment of silence. Thank you. And now um, to invite any acknowledgments from the council or the board members, I should say. I have a really quick one. Yes. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that um, tomorrow we have a, an event at Weaver State University that is um, the uh, folkloric ballet from the city of Guadalajara. It's coming uh, to perform at Weaver State tomorrow at 7 p.m. And they were here last year and came back this year and hopefully we'll come back again next year. And um, uh, there, might be, there might be some tickets still available on the website at Weber State's uh, ticket office um, online. So it'll be a really fun event. Hope to see anyone that can be there tomorrow. Thank you so much. Any other acknowledgments? Well, I would love to acknowledge, I mean, this last weekend was incredible in Ogden City. I went to a car show on Friday. I know there was a tattoo convention in Union Station that was very, very popular. Um, the Marshall White closing ceremony also commenced on Friday. A wonderful event where family members and community members that served the center and then also grew up in the center, um, talked about their times there. <clears throat> and then we also had the Ogden Music Festival this last weekend. And then next weekend, we have the Ogden Art Festival coming up. So I don't even know if I have named everything that's happened um, in the city, but certainly a very busy place. Yeah. Any other acknowledgments? Okay. Alrighty. Um, so right now we'll have a public hearing, and this is regarding the airport community and re reinvestment area. We'll have a presentation on all of the five items listed there, and then we'll have time for public input. We'll invite Brandon Cooper, our Director of Community Economic <clears throat> Development. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Board. Appreciate your time tonight. As you mentioned, um, my presentation will cover um, a number of resolutions, uh, resolution 2311, uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15, as it shows on the agenda. And that's essentially the project area plan and budget and the interlocal agreements that uh, support that. Uh, just a little background on the condition of the redevelopment agency. Uh, we have 13 project areas, um, not including the proposed airport CRA. These are 13 project areas that we currently manage. We have two expiring in the next year. Um, that will um, that will be in the RDA and uh, and yeah both in the RDA category. So we'll lose a couple in that nomenclature. Um, and if tonight is approved, uh, we will add um, the airport CRA into the CRA category. Uh, the, the Ogden Airport has uh, been a significant economic um, component in our community for a long, long time. It's, uh, since the, <clears throat> the uh, up until the 60s, uh, we rivaled the facilities in Salt Lake City. Uh, we were the transportation hub of the West um, with both rail and air service um, through the city. And uh, we were 
in the sweet spot. We were a preferred geographic location, and because of that, we had two major airlines um, that uh, uh, provided major service to the West and to the Midwest. Uh, once uh, Salt Lake City received international uh, status in 1968, we started to wane as an airport. Um, and then added to that was the um, decline of uh, railroads and other things that led to Ogden losing our national hub status. Uh, in 2020, uh, as generally operating as a general aviation airport for a long, long time, we embarked on a master plan that uh, was approved by the city council. Uh, and that master plan looked at our growth and development opportunities in a number of areas. Um, general aviation, of course, commercial passenger, passenger service. Um, we enjoyed uh, two commercial passenger airlines for a while, uh, Allegiant being around for about 10 years. Uh, we looked at cargo being um, a significant uh, service through the airport. Aerospace and defense is one that we're very excited about and um, have done a lot to prepare for in terms of the opportunities that lie ahead there. Uh, so we've essentially uh, established the future plans of the airport um, through the adopted master plan uh, on three legs of the stool, general aviation, commercial passenger service, and commercial uh, service in general. And so our goal is to expand Ogden's role, again, to be a regional economic engine, and that is through a commitment to uh, cultivate those three areas that I just mentioned. We've had a project area in the past uh, that didn't comprise the entire airport. You can see the map there in that dark red square with the highlighted uh, boundary. This project area was uh, from 2005 until 2021, and this was largely to support the development that happened at the uh, Kemp Center. As I mentioned, it expired um, in 2021, and so today's proposal is to look at a new project area that uh, encompasses the entire airport boundary, um, in addition to some property to the north across uh, Hinkley Drive. Um, it doesn't actually take up the entire uh, airport um, airfield because, believe it or not, some of the airport's actually in Roy, and so we're constrained to the um, boundary of Ogden City. So that's what that line is at the bottom there, uh, although the, some of the airport is outside of the C proposed CRA boundary, it's also outside of Ogden City, and therefore uh, we'll just leave it there. It's, it's essentially um, the uh, end of the runway. So we've been looking at this for a, a number of years. We've been preparing for the conclusion of the old Hinkley um, project area and in preparation of today uh, in terms of creating a new project area that encompasses a wider range of the airport. Uh, we've been working with our taxing partners. Um, in this case, we've approached four, and I'll mention those um, specifically uh, in a minute, but uh, those are the Central Weber Sewer District, Ogden City, the Ogden School District, and Weber County. And um, all th three of those, um, subject to tonight's action with the city, uh, three of those have uh, approved the interlocal agreements that I'll explain in just a moment. Here is a, just a reference to our short-term, uh, intermediate-term, and long-term plans uh, at the airport that were part of the adopted master plan. I just wanted to reference those uh, to, again, reiterate that uh, we are um, using the master plan that's been approved as the basis of our, of our um, proposal. As, as I mentioned, um, those three uh, legs of the stool being general aviation, commercial passenger service, and commercial service in general. Uh, we do have key projects that we are pursuing and or preparing for, uh, both in the aerospace and defense um, sector. Uh, we do have a specific um, project that we are pursuing uh, that has a national search and has shortlisted the, the Ogden Airport for their, um, for their business. That's a commercial non-military aerospace company. Uh, we want to enhance commercial hangar construction, um, both the renovation of old hangars and the construction of new hangars, uh, and then again, the, the, um, for commercial purposes, and then the expansion of private hangar um, as well. So there's a number of development objectives stated in the plan. I won't read all of those, but certainly strength, strengthening the tax base is uh, always at the core of everything that we do in the RDA and through economic development. Uh, we have aged or um, or non-existent infrastructure. So 
uh, having a financial tool to help uh, uh, create some of those things that are necessary for uh, expanded development is, is important. Um, developing vacant land is key. Uh, not all of the airport in that boundary that I showed you is developable, but there is a significant portion of it that is, and it just needs a little bit of assistance. And then certainly our goal is to support Hill Air Force Base with the programs and activities that happen there. They're constantly bursting at the seam. Uh, they're constantly looking for off-base uh, airport or uh, runway supported land, and we are uh, in a within a stone's throw of that. And so we work closely with them to make sure that we're doing things that will be consistent with their goals. So the, what is the tax increment to be used for? Uh, utility upgrades, roadway upgrades, building construction um, and building upgrades of existing buildings, uh, direct incentive for jobs and development, uh, taxiway upgrades and other airport expenses as uh, eligible under state law and, and deemed necessary through the RDA and through the airport administration. Uh, there's a significant public benefit, and there's a report in the, um, in the documents in the packet that show that uh, with our projected um, key projects and proposed uh, and, and uh, expected development, we can see up to 300 to $400 million of investment, and that would bring new jobs at higher wages, um, economic diversification, as I mentioned, um, direct support to Hill Air Force Base, and um, direct purchase of purchase of supplies and services during construction periods. I uh, wanted to highlight the process for selecting participants. Uh, this um, is one thing that often goes overlooked in proposed project area plans. Uh, we encourage and have a preference for working with um, any owners that are in that project area. Uh, mostly the, the land is owned by the airport, but north of the airport on Hinkley Drive, there is a number of private owners, as well as a few on airport as well. But our goal is to work with um, current owners um, and uh, lessees for um, development undertakings. That's our primary target is to work with existing folks, but then in the event that that is not feasible or possible, then we would uh, select um, other folks to come in and to either um, buy properties, develop properties in conjunction with owners, those kind of things. So what does a project area do specifically? It uh, provides additional financial tools to the RDA through the mechanism of tax increment. It redirects some of that, those taxes that would be paid um, to, from the participating, participating entities to the redevelopment agency, and therefore we're able to then uh, reinvest that specifically in the airport. It allows us to enhance our business competition. Um, like it or not, in the business world, um, corporate incentives are real. Um, Utah in general and Ogden um, kind of follow suit with this. We don't lead with our incentives. We lead with our quality of life. And, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't, uh, that we can't sit on our laurels, rest on our laurels. And so we have to have financial tools that allow, allow us to build incentives that, um, that help us to be competitive. It fills project gaps, so that's the feasibility analysis that we do when we're presented with a project uh, that may not be feasible due to market conditions. Uh, it attracts additional investment and facilitates faster than normal growth. We've uh, analyzed this in multiple presentations in previous years. I've shown how uh, properties that are inside of project areas grow three to four times faster in valuation than pro properties outside of project areas. And that's due to the fact that you're compounding that investment in a, a particular area. Uh, and then lastly, it augments our existing plans. Um, again, we, uh, we're basing all of this on the master plan uh, that was adopted at the airport and all of the, the um, objectives and guidelines within the new project area plan, we just augment those existing plans. What does a project area not do? Um, it does not increase taxes, uh, either to the individuals within the project area, the ind individual project owners, or to the, to the uh, community in general. Uh, it does not change existing zoning. So uh, that doesn't mean that existing zoning can't change, but there's a regulatory process for that to happen, and the RDA the adoption of an RDA project area plan does not automatically do that. There is no eminent domain, so therefore there is no taking of hangars or buildings that this uh, proposed plan would allow for. Uh, so if there is 
any type of buying and selling that has to be through willing partners. It does not affect the general operations or policies of the airport. Uh, so um, anything that the airport operates under from an um, ordinance or from an administrative policy, those all remain intact and are unaffected by this new plan. It, it does not expand the existing boundary of the airport. Um, that is a geographic boundary that's set by the FAA, so we're not expanding that boundary, even though the project area plan does include a larger boundary than the, the airport itself. It does not, um, by virtue of the plan, expand the airport boundary. And as I mentioned a minute ago, it doesn't exclude existing owners from participating. In fact, that's our preference is to um, focus on those folks that are currently there and, and helping them to succeed. So um, I mentioned before, there's a number of uh, participating entities, uh, the county, Ogden School District, uh, Ogden City, which is yet to be determined in the following meeting, and then Central Weaver uh, Sewer District. Uh, they all have elected to participate for the full 25 years, but at different participation rates. So you can see there that the county is at 90%. Uh, participation up to 17 million. That means that during the life of the project area, which is 25 years, if that um, contribution has been met either at the 90% level or the $17 million level, then their interlocal agreement terminates. And that goes with all of the other entities, 85% uh, for Ogden School District, 95% for the city, and 85% for the Central Weaver uh, Sewer District. Uh, you can see that um, all of those together reach the maximum participation amount of $119 million. So, uh, even if there are years left within the project area and we've re reached that maximum contribution of 119 million, then all of the interlocals terminate and the project area um, sunsets. You have a uh, question? Can you tell I had a question? No. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I don't think you've gotten into it yet on here, but the housing administration um, amount. I know that we mentioned this before in the work session, but there certainly won't be any housing in this development area, right? That's right. So that's the last thing there on the bottom. Um, we have allocated 5% for admin. Um, usually we go up, up to 10, but because of the bigger budget, we reduce that to 5 based on negotiations with our, with our participating entities. And then um, in this case, it's the full allocation of the 20%. That money goes into a housing fund and based on state criteria can be used anywhere within the city um, for housing. Thank you. Chair, can I? Yeah. Um, as far, yeah, thank you. Um, the base year valuation, the, the 211 million, all of the taxing entities will receive their appropriate tax benefit from that base value clear through the entire uh, term of the CRA, right? That's right. I, I omitted that slide that you're used to seeing, which is the, the, uh, the sliding scale. But yes, that's a base year valuation that's frozen during for the entire duration. So each entity that's participating will receive um, taxes on that base value for the full term. I, I, I just think that's an important uh, element of, an, of any of these uh, CRAs lest we think we're kind of cheating people out of something. You know, it, it, this really doesn't change what the status quo per se. Um, it just takes some of the increase for a period of time to pay for the, 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 uh, the improvements. You're right. And um, all of our taxing entities have those same questions. And for years, we've been having these conversations. Central Weber is a new one to the table. Um, ever since the tax taxing entity committee was um, terminated and uh, the statute then transitioned into interlocal agreements. We've generally just worked with the three big entities, county, city, and school district. In this case, we felt like there was a benefit to the Central Weber. They saw that as well, but they have all those same questions because they're wondering why the investment is needed and why isn't development, development happening otherwise. And so um, through discussions uh, and through um, talk on the master plan and the, the uh, discussion on the, on the three main objectives of the airport, all of the entities um, uh, easily were able to see the benefit and the need because without the investment of tax increment, the uh, investment levels that we're projecting are unlikely to happen. So they all see that and they're willing to 
um, provide that kind of participation. And they know it's a but for situation, meaning that uh, unless that unless we all come together and focus our objectives and our efforts to one goal, then it's likely not going to happen. And they'll get less in the same amount of time if it was just left uh, to its own devices. And that's really the, kind of the, the beauty of RDAs. I'm kind of scratching my head a little bit about the the sewer district. Mm -hmm. They don't have they don't receive new growth the same as as other entities like like the city and uh, and I'm I guess I'm gonna have to have a chat with you and Lisa probably get an education because I I think it's I think it's a real misunderstanding I, I just because it's different they get they have to do a truth of taxation to get any extra mm -hmm. dollars no matter how much new growth happens around. Right. And their connection fees are important to them and their right. their usage is important. So they saw some benefit there. Yeah. Okay. I just, you know, and I was at the sewer board meeting when you, you presented and, and mm -hmm. that was not brought up right. by anybody. Um, so I th is it I think Kevin? Who's the Kevin's the director? Yeah, yeah. Um, we chatted chatted about that um, at length uh, because again we hadn't participated with them much in the past outside of the tech, and so it was important for us to understand how they receive their revenue, how they how their funds are set up to where yeah. that revenue goes and what it can and can't be used for. So they were helpful. Well, a new thing has changed. There, they now have the benefit of of Camille, which we yeah. used to have the benefit of. Yeah. And I think she understands this from the other standpoint uh, better than mm -hmm. who she replaced. So. so we can get together, you, Lisa, myself. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love Kevin. to have that because I, yeah. think, I think there does need to be some education. I agree. Okay, and I, just have, I did have a follow-up, too, because I was noticing our base year valuation is 2020, but then in the area, we're starting at January 2023. So mm -hmm. what about those in-between years? What happens there? Well, um, the base year valuation is just negotiation. So that's the t that's the amount that is frozen over time that gets okay. taxed. Um, the question, if I understand it correctly, is what happens if that valuation um, increases or decreases between the time that it's frozen and the time that we start collecting? Exactly, you're reading my mind. Yeah, the case in this case, it's actually decreased. Okay. Um, it's, it's kind of complicated because of how um, the assessed values are created out right. there, but we have a, a condition called Book 30, which is a valuation of the, the hangar leases. And those hangers, um, those Book 30 uh, valuations in 2020 um, were about $23 million of that $211 million. And um, in 2022, the valuation was about 13 million. So it had decreased about $10 million over the period of time that we've been doing this. Okay. Okay, so our recommendation is that uh, you approve uh, resolutions 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, which is the project area plan and budget and the interlocal agreements between the participating entities. Great, any other questions from board members? Not seeing any right now, so we'll go ahead and take some public input. So, if anyone in the audience would like to comment on this item alone, the airport community reinvestment area, you may step to the podium and state your name for the record. And you have three minutes, or if you're online and you're connected through the Zoom meeting, you can raise your hand. Come on up, welcome. My name is Kim Wilwright. I've actually got more questions than I do comments. Um, Great. So well, you can ask them all and then do it all in your three minutes, and then if we have answers, we can attempt to answer them after all the comments. Okay. So when I got the brief, and I just I read it yesterday, I was a little confused. So this red line area, and I'm wondering if Brandon would be helpful, this red line area, is that the, just the taxing entity, or is that just the redevelopment area, and the taxing mm -hmm. entity is the whole city taxing entity and what do you mean by taxing entity okay it talks about mm -hmm. levying taxes to uh -huh. generate this so 
my assumption when I read this was it was, it was just the redevelopment agency, the redevelopment area that was going to be increased in that was going to collect those taxes. Yeah, that's my understanding too, but we can uh, make sure. So I'm, my comment would be is that if this generates the whole city, then the whole city ought to be taxed by that. The other comment that was made about the airport uh, area and the, uh, let's see, the, the original airport development plan and um, that plan actually had uh, pieces in it where the people that were inside that property were going to forfeit their property and give it back to the airport. And I'm not talking immediately inside the airport property, but even across the streets. Mm -hmm. And is that still on the table? Because he said this, he set up there that this is not about taking hangers and things of that nature. So I'm a little confused. Sure. And I think it's a little premature to vote on this when this has just been dumped on the public in this fashion. This, the flyer that we got told us what you're going to do with the money or what you want to do with the money or that you need the money, but it didn't tell us all the information about the background and what's going to go on in the presentation that we just saw. I've got lots of questions on that that I didn't get to answer or ask. Okay. So those are my comments for now. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, Travis Pate, Dogden uh, resident. I, my question with regards to this is just if we're creating another LRA just to uh, superfund other sites, uh, all the current LRAs and re redevelopment areas just need to be, there needs to be some accountability. We have a Lester Park area that is obviously now coming to close, but where did all that money go? It didn't definitely come to our neighborhood. It went down to the junction. And is this going to be taxing and then we're just going to sharpen a pencil and dump it into the wonder block? Because if you go to Moody's, <laughs> commercial office space is defaulting at a pretty significant rate. And yet we're going to give $180 million to that type of thing. So or is this, if, if, if money solely invests right back into the project area, I'm saying yes, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. But if we're just going to just keep robbing Peter to pay Paul, if we're going to take city council approved money and pay $800,000 for bleachers, <laughs> like we did under the past administration, then we're, there's got to be some accountability. And so I think to me, it's just the accountability that says, yes, we'll approve this, but only under this condition that all the money stays at the airport. Because it's just, I, I, it's the, the shell game that this, this administration has played, but the previous administration played very well, and this one just mirrors it. Just horrible. And I think the aspect of just resolving some of the hangar issues and other things that uh, saying what's really happening at the airport as a whole. And so if this is needed, uh, then also those guidelines like we raise and sewer, if this is their obligation and this is where the money goes, oh, well, we'll keep that amount of money under this guideline. But the rest of this, we're just going to pull around. So to me, I, I think there should be, before this one is approved, an accountability of every all, uh, redevelopment area that has been done and where that money has gone. If it's gone outside, just as they suggested a couple weeks ago, all the different things that are coming due, that we now still have outstanding debt with the junction, not, not feasible. And then the other aspect is, is uh, council member slash board member Luis talked about turning sometimes a minute back. So if individuals have questions, go back to that minute that it was suggested years ago to just make sure those individuals questions are answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Klug. I'm from uh, New Astra Tierra. I'm a land owner and business owner on uh, the, the property that's across 31st Street from the airport. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, this is not my world, so I apologize my ignorance on some of these issues, but uh, I got this letter a month ago, um, which isn't a whole lot of time to process, I guess, what is actually going on. There's a lot of confusion from us. I, I mirror the gentleman's comments that it's, it's moving so quickly, and I, my business is not a benefit. Of, we do not benefit from an improvement of the airport. We do not, we're not a direct beneficiary of that. I understand that 
there's a, a benefit to the community for the airport. I get that. And I'm not going to sit here and say that's crazy. But what is unusual to me is that we're across 31st Street. And we're not part of the airport, per se. And you know, the gentleman before was talking about runway adjacent uh, you know, properties, and that's important to draw in, in uh, these companies and so forth, the aerospace companies. Well, that's all good, but my land is not runway adjacent. It never will be unless you reroute 31st Street or put a tunnel under. So it, it strikes me, and again, I apologize. This isn't my world. But it strikes me as a bit of a land grab when you start going over 31st Street and just carving out this seemingly random bulbous area uh, of land and just saying, well, that's part of it too. So I'm opposed to it. Uh, it just it, it doesn't strike me that consideration is being given to the owners uh, across from 31st Street on this. Uh, I would understand more if my property was bordering a runway. Um, so I. That's pretty much what I want to say about this. I, you know, like I said, I don't expect anybody to really care too much about my business, um, but my business will not be easy to move. You know, it's already affecting my land values and it's creating uncertainty in the area. And it's already cost me legal fees, frankly. So this has been a very negative thing for our business already, and it hasn't even been approved. I would like that to be considered. And uh, if there's anybody here that's like-minded, uh, please find me uh, before you leave. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm going to show you I definitely care about okay. your business. Yeah. May I ask if yeah. I'm curious yeah. if you mind sharing what his business is? Uh, we So Nuestra Tierra is the name of the business, or that's the landowner and so forth. And then we own a recycling facility, a facility across the street from it. So uh -huh. so, so are you in, the, in that CRA boundary? We are in that okay. boundary. So, and uh, like I said, it's it's not going to be an easy business to move. So, so it's a, across Hinkley Drive. You're saying I'm just looking at the map, trying to double see, make sure I understand. Or across 31st Street. Yeah. So, like I said, we, there's no direct access to the airport from our property. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Blake Ballard. Obviously, I have the Chevron on 31st Street, Pennsylvania, and 3300. Um, we've been there for about three years. I guess my biggest concern is the competition that was on the, the overhead. I pretty much I pretty much invested everything I have into that gas station. Um, the city required me to put have power poles underneath Pennsylvania Avenue. We have an extra water collection area. I have two water collection areas on my property, one for the city, one for myself. So I've already been an investor in the area. So I don't, I guess I'm not on board to incentivize or to give rewards for my competition to come in. So I just want to know what protection there is for existing owners and basically that have already poured everything that they have into, into the area. And I'm, also, I'm probably more more recent than anyone, so that's my biggest question. Okay, thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Paul Sorensen, and uh, I own a building uh, across the street from the airport. And uh, you know, concern is definitely any increases in property taxes for that building. Uh, the current occupant of that building sells juice products, uh, and I don't think this anything done at the airport is going to dramatically increase their business at all. So I don't know what they would be able to support as far as any kind of increased leases resulting from an increase in taxes. Um, now, I saw from the presentation that it says that what the CR, CRA does not do is increase taxes. Um, but yet, reading the thing here, the CRA proposal says if the, if the plan and budget are adopted, then property tax revenues resulting from an increase in valuation of the property. So does that mean, so did the presentation mean that tax rates aren't going up, but property values are going to go up? And is that natural through, yeah, okay, whatever you guys do at the airport actually does increase them? Or is it forced from the beginning? 
uh, the minute this approved is now the property valuation from a tax purpose double what it was last year, which was 15% up from the year prior. Uh, kind of some questions on that. You know, I suspect if it's natural and the, and the value is there and that if we sold that property that we would get that value, then that kind of makes a little bit more sense. But I don't quite understand how it doesn't increase taxes, but that's where the money is going to come from, obviously. So if someone could expand on that, that would be helpful. You bet. That's a good question. Thank you. Let's see if I can read my handwriting up there. Welcome. How you doing? Been a hot minute. My name is David Carlson. Um, I think a lot of it's Ogden Airport's optics is a problem because of the past mistruths we've been told here. We've all been, all the people at Ogden Airport have been told a lot of mistruths. I've got a very good friend of mine who's ready to buy a 10 million, put a $10 million hangar at your airport. But with these redevelopment areas that have been drawn around, we drew them, I've been here four or five times, everybody's seen me. We drew one around my hangar. Okay, so I did, my lease did come up this year. I paid for it, I built a $210,000 shop to take care of those, the ground equipment at the airport. Gary Williams said, you can't do it anymore. He still gave me the same invoice, four times as much. I asked for a proper invoice. So my buddy, who I hang out with, I look at him and say, why would you take $10 million and spend it on a hangar when they haven't even offered, they even, you didn't even honor my very first lease. And then the mayor has offered Five more years. That's great, except the fact that I'm still in that redevelopment zone. So I have to go up to code, which I've seen people pay $10,000, $12,000 to bring their crap up to code. But because I'm still in a redevelopment area, I'm only, I have a lease that says it's five years, but it's a 180 days lease that renews every day. So why would I invest my money? First of all, you, he invests all his money in Chevron. I invested everything I have. And now it's gone. My business, my livelihood's all gone. Because Gary, and Gary took, he cashed my check. And I've got all the emails, and it's, I've showed you that he tells mistruths, and he told this city council mistruths. I showed it to you, I proved it to you. The other thing, you wonder where your tax base went, you know, went from 30 million to 13 million. It's not because these people that have hangers, <coughs> bless you, it's not because these people that, that have hangers and airplanes don't have the money. It's because you guys want to do this, and then you want to do this, and then you want to do, if you would have just developed the other side of the air, airport hangar, people would have come. But when you shot the people, you shot the people in the foot, or you shot the people that brought you to the dance. That's what happened to your tax base. And all your tax base is gone because, and talk to the people at the RA, we know exactly why your tax base is gone. And that's where it went. But again, I can't even get a proper invoice. I'm using my hangar for aviation use. But believe me, I gave them sixteen hundred dollars what I was supposed to give them. They invoiced me, and Gary would have come and said, "You're in default. Get off the airport." So there's another five grand, forty-one. However, I got the numbers, but I don't have them with me today. <coughs> but you know, you're, they're willing to take your checks, and they're willing to take your stuff. You say you're not taking hangers. Well, they're still taking them. So maybe not in this new redevelopment area, but the old redevelopment area is still sitting there with those rules. And now you're going to vote on another one. I think you should look at what happened with the old one, old one first, you know, because I can't do anything with my hangar except get it off the airport. If that's what we want to do, that's what we're going to do. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. My name is Dr. April Greener, and I am speaking on behalf of my family. My family bought a hangar 42 years ago and still owns it today and are part of the redevelopment process. And I just wanted to say, I currently live in Missouri. I came here today um, to attend this meeting and also to take care of some other things that I was thrown into when my mom passed away two months ago and I'm now learning as much as I possibly can about the airport and what this new development means for us. And um, I wanted to say that tenants do not have stability in their leases when the city objects new terms in renewals. One of those terms is that the city wants to take back ownership once the age of a property hits 40 years old without compensation to owners. You can have an immaculate building that you lose once it's 40 years old. I lived on historic Jackson Avenue for nearly eight years. Many of the homes were over 40 years old. So by this standard, we should just go down and bulldoze all of the houses there because they're no longer meeting city standards. Um, 
The city has damaged the image of the airport and, its needs to bring, and it needs to bring stability back. The city needs to rebuild trust with tenants and potential tenants. Moving forward with this as quickly as you want to without tenant support is the opposite of achieving this and I hope you'll consider that. Kelly Crozier, uh, there's two things that you come up. Uh, number one, you're 30 million down to 11 million. Everybody but two of you, if I remember right, voted for that. So you're responsible for that $19 million you're losing, but yet you're wanting to come back in here and put it in. Another thing that was brought up was master plan at the airport, follow it. What you're trying to do or was trying to do until a month or two ago is totally opposite of your master plan. Okay, if you're going to put a master plan out there, follow it, or at least come up with something different than what you have done. But you really need to look at that $19 million you lost because of what all but two of you voted for. Okay, if you get rid of your Title VIII, you'll get people coming in here building. Just look at the hell attack group that you lost. Okay, and you guys lost it because of the Title VIII. Of your rules and regulations is why it was lost. Fix Title VIII, you'll have all kinds of money. You won't have to do this. Thank you. I'm Lisa Babbitt. We own property across town from the airport. We've been there well over 40 years. And not too long ago, you didn't really give us the opportunity. You told us we're going to be annexed in Dogden City. And this was your plan all along. And I feel like you were deceiving us because you didn't give us an opportunity to stay in Weber County because this was your plan. We have been there for a long time. Our business operates out of there. We function out of there. I can't just pick up and move because you want an airport to be here. Do I trust that you're going to work with us, help us? No. I think that you're going to force us out of our property and you really don't care if our business thrives or not. We have been there a long time. It works for us. I don't want to move. I don't agree with this plan. Do you mind telling us what your business is? Singleton Landscaping. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, come on up. We have a few online too. Welcome. Scott Vanda High, property owner on the north side. I'm a little confused though. how come we're trying to tax a specific area that's doing that, helping the airport or whatever and that out. To me, that'd be like if I sit there and says, okay, everybody that lives north of Harrison Boulevard needs to pay for this. I don't think that's quite fair. <clears throat> the other thing is that the airport itself have a long history of it. Uh, family members that work at the airport, family members that grew up at the Forest Service. Um, one time I tried taking over the airport uh, hangers it has been going on for a long time. And that the uh, federal government came in, sued Ogden City, and said, no, you can't have the Forest Service building. That's their property. And that we keep trying to go back and forth on who we're going to allow at the airport and who we're not going to allow at the airport. You keep losing tenants. That's money coming into the city. And that. So I have tenants on the other side than the north side. Now you're talking about wanting to take and tax them more. It's not going to benefit their business by their rates going up because they can't compete with other businesses that are in the same line of work because they're going to have to pay higher taxes. So their profit margin is going to go down. So they're going to want to move out of Ogden City into West Haven. I've seen a lot of businesses leaving Ogden City. For every one that comes into Ogden, five are going out because your tax base is killing everybody and that. Also, the way you work with it. Have you thought about the cities around you? Roy City is already complaining about the airport being there and the number of crashes that have occurred. Filed competitions with the FAA because they want to know why there are planes crashing in their city and that. Now you want to bring in more air traffic and that. I don't think the cities around us are going to be real happy about that. The other thing is that the Airport it has a history of just not being there. FTOs, which is the operating facilities that maintain the airplanes, come and go. They haven't been there very long. They can't maintain it. They don't have enough business. 
airlines that have come in can't do it. They're moving the Provo. Reason for it is there is over 150 new tech businesses in the Provo area. They have eight lanes after 7200 South going southbound to the Provo area. There's a lot of people living down that way. There's a lot of businesses. That airport can sustain it. This airport's landlocked. It can't go anywhere. I don't know why you want my property on across the Hinkley Airport. It's not going to benefit me. I'm not going to build a new building to put some sort of high-tech business in there. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, Teresa Bramwell. Um, I just have a question about uh, Brandon Cooper said in his um, speech that there would be no eminent domain for this project, but the current property owners, of which we've heard from many of them today, uh, will be invited to participate in the plan. Um, so if eminent domain is off the table and the current these people that are here concerned about their businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to be invited to participate, I would like to know what that looks like. How does that happen? How does the, the, this guy in the green that owns the recycling plant, I've, I've, I'm a customer of his, I've been there before, um, how will he be invited to participate in an airport? And how will that benefit him? That's my specific question, and I would like to know what the landscape of that looks like. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm Dale Brandon. I'm uh, here on behalf of Williams International, who's an aerospace manufacturer on the north end of the airport. Uh, this proposed plan would benefit us greatly. Um, we. In 2001, we built a 100,000 square foot manufacturing facility addition. Uh, we're currently in the process of building a 30,000 square foot addition. Uh, it's proposed that uh, we increase our current manufacturing uh, double. Basically, they're looking right now at, at increasing from 400,000 to 800,000 square foot in Ogden. Um, this project would go towards points for Ogden, for us here in Ogden, um, over some of the other areas they're considering. Um, we currently employ roughly 950 people in the Ogden facility, and by the nature of doubling the facility, that number would have to grow too. Um, so I would encourage the passage of this. I understand the increase in taxes would only be based off of whatever your property value increases based on your improvements. Like I said, we've done the 100,000 square foot. We're currently just wrapping up a beautification project at our entrance um, that we've, we've done all those without any incentives just because we saw the need and we're trying to improve things. And uh, I would really like to see that employer grow in the Ogden area more than it has. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments in the audience? Thank you. Come on up. We've got a few people online also. Good evening. Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. It is good to be here, and thank you for being with us. Um, I just got back from North Carolina. I went to the Strong Towns National Gathering as I was invited to speak on a panel. And uh, Strong Towns is a new innovative approach to urban planning. Uh, Joe Minicosi, speaker on that panel. And um, I got a copy of the uh, report that we paid $42,000 for because I ran into him because we didn't have it. So he sent it to me. Um, and one of the things that he lifts up in this report from 2016 is to uh, indicate on what parts of the TIF program should be replicated, see how things settle, and uh, find other developers that are going to work with it. Basically, it's, it's make sure that what you're doing is working. Check the receipts. And that's exactly what the state auditor said 
uh, the Utah State Legislative Auditor General, as you know, we failed our audit, and as Marcia will bring up, that uh, it's not illegal, but that's exactly what a uh, piece of legislature that went through in 2022 wanted to fix, and it's coming back again. And it's going to be driven by the Utah Taxpayers Association because this is not best practices. Our house is not in order. You, it just seems really dumb to me to continue to do something without making sure on paper showing how it worked. Um, and then the other piece that really perplexes me about this whole CRA thing is that Hill Air Force has the MITA program, which is an enhanced lease use thing, which allows them to do what we're trying to do at the airport. So why would a prime come here when they can be at Hill Air Force Base and get really reduced lease rates and the Air Force can continue to develop? Uh, you know, that the MITA program is going strong. And then I'd also like to lift up what some of the other folks here have said, is that I am, I am not against TIF. I am not against economic development. I believe that TIF should be used sparingly and deliberately. But what was lifted up here is that TIF benefits and a CRA don't apply to everyone there. The CED picks winners and losers. Who's going to benefit from this? And so if you're not making sure everybody does, then we are literally leaving those people who have invested deeply into the airport, who have made this their lives, and, and are our own local people, businesses here, we're putting them out in the cold. And we don't have a signed MOU for a prime. So why would you expand this if you don't know about whether or not the other CRAs are working on paper? Thank you. Any other comments here in the audience? I have something to say, and this is way out of you know my expertise. But I Can listened you state to your this. Name for the oh, record? Laura Lewis. Thank you. Um, I listened to this, and there's no eminent domain. But listening to these taxes and how they're going to affect people's business, and are they going to be allowed to pass that cost on to renters or uh, generate enough income to meet that? It seems like that they could be forced out of their property just by the tax increases that you're going to have. So it's kind of like eminent domain in another form. If they can't remain profitable, they'll end up sell selling their property. So to me, it just seems uh, the same thing under another name, increasing property tax uh, like that. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll go ahead and go online. It looks like um, Jordan Silver may be the first one. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself and state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. Record, and you have three minutes. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Jordan Silver. I'm an Ogden resident. I'm also a, a wildland firefighting pilot for the Forest Service based out of Ogden, and my family owns a hangar on the airport. Um, based on how incredibly complicated, yet super vague this document is and uh, as stated by others how shortly us the public has had our eyeballs on it I cannot as an Ogden resident support moving this CRA forward until I the members of the airport community and the City Council have had more time to come to an understanding of what exactly the ramifications are you know I I, I, I like what Angel said you know um, Brandon mentioned this project Excuse me, Brandon mentioned this project's predicated on the airport master plan and the underlying success of the airport. I really hope those involved are beginning to see that the airport is in deep crisis and to put, uh, to put it kindly, and that the idea that there will be an influx of private and commercial entities at the airport under the current state of things is a total pipe dream. Um, there has been talk lately, uh, some positive talk, it's only talk. Uh, about some positive changes for those of us at the airport, but until tangible changes are at hand, I cannot, as a resident, support passing of this CRA at this time. And uh, I, I'll just like to add on, you know, I've I've basically come to a point where I'm putting a time limit on it um, on Ogden overall. Uh, I've grown up here, I've been involved in this airport a long time, but basically, if, if by the end of this fire season, I haven't seen positive changes at the airport. And in the city, I'm I'm moving. I'm leaving Ogden and and taking, you know, 
myself and my family out. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Next up, we have Brian. Thank you. I'm ready to begin. Yes, go ahead. I'm Brian January, uh, multiple business owner uh, at the Ogden Airport as far as hangars and off the airport as aerospace and defense. While the idea of developing a way to provide financial incentives for developers to move forward with projects in the proposed airport CRA is a positive step from my perspective, the following must be noted. Due to the city's current lease and Title eight stipulations in the last several years of the city's actions with dealing with airport private and commercial entities, it is well known and recognized that businesses are leaving, including mine, the Ogden Airport, due to the unfavorable and untenable business constraints enacted by Ogden City. Additionally, and not surprisingly, prospective new businesses have been walking away from establishing a business partnership with Ogden City upon completing their due diligence processes. Yes, uh, there's talk about the co-named different businesses that are looking at it and Hill Air Force Base. Uh, that's been the same story for four to five, six, seven years. None of that has happened. Recently, on the positive side, recently there, there appears to be a positive change in the city's approach to these issues based on meetings held with the city's community and economic development director, Brandon Cooper. While this is encouraging, more concrete actions, specifically with lease and Title VIII rewrites, are needed along with senior Cedar city leadership level involvement to turn the corner and set up both Ogden Airport and its customers for future success, potentially afforded by the proposed CRA. I have uh, spent an a fair amount of time gaining understanding of the process and understand that it doesn't raise taxes. It's providing taxes that are going to be collected over time, a uh, piece of that. Obviously, value should go up if the airport actually were to uh, be a value proposition. And uh, I, I think the city would do well by uh, answering the questions that the other folks have asked. Uh, they have well-founded concerns from perhaps my understanding and lack of time uh, to develop this. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Up next, we have um, Heath Sato. Hi, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, I had some similar questions as other people. Um, in regards to uh, Falcon Hill being right next to um, Hill with millions and millions of square feet of developable space, um, I'm, I'm curious how we are planning on competing with that because we're being sold this idea that uh, this $64 million we're going to pay a developer to build an office building and they're kind of selling that on, you know, defense aerospace. We'll do that and Union Station campus. That'll be defense and aerospace. And we're, we're, we're putting a lot on um, a, a sector of industry that, that we have very direct competition for. And I would like to see a little more research and numbers on these things and um, and so we can maybe spend less time trying to bring in outside developers and focus a little more on our small businesses that are here um, and taxes aren't technically directly raised by these programs, but they are indirectly raised. We've seen our taxes go up. We've seen the city budget go up tremendously in just the last eight, last eight years. Um, we seem to just be chasing money to pay our government instead of looking at other things that are important to a community. That's all. 
Thanks. Thank you. Up next, we have Ed McKinney. You can unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead and state your name for the record, even though I just said it. Excellent. <laughs> Will do. Ed McKinney, Eden, Utah. Um, first of all, I appreciate the amount of work that went into the CRA and uh, the potential benefit that it provide, could provide. And um, want to also thank Brandon Cooper for the interactions we've had with him uh, recently. Um, I'm hoping that this is not, that the approval of this CRA is not a, a rubber stamp by the council for the airport. We've had a few of those in the past, as you know. Uh, this is a very, very complex proposal. Um, in the recent city council work session, member Nadalski asked uh, uh, Mr. Cooper if um, the airport advisory committee had reviewed the uh, CRA and uh, his response back was that the committee would have an opportunity through the public comment session, which uh, doesn't really uh, align with the complexity of this document, in, in my opinion. My question is, um, what would this say about the city council if you're willing to pass this CRA without a review by the advisory committee that you elected to advise you? And um, I think that's um, a critical question. Uh, it says in the CRA document that a project area plan, I'm quoting this, may not be adopted if 51% or more of the property owners object. Uh, my question is, who are the property owners? Uh, how do they approve or reject? And, uh, you know, how many property owners are part, make up part of this population? So that's another question for the council to consider, hopefully, uh, before approving. Uh, also, the CRA vision statement uh, describes expanding Ogden's uh, uh, airport's role as an economic engine in the region through a commitment to serve and cultivate general aviation and commercial service growth and aeronautical business opportunities. Um, with the loss of uh, our airlines, with the loss of businesses, with the loss of um, over 27 aircraft owners at the airport with the expansion of Morgan and Brigham City. Uh, my question is, are we really an economic engine or is it uh, more of um, um, something going in the other direction? So the question is, what is the plan to change this negative trend uh, before we embark on a, on a very substantial investment? And finally, I asked the city council to not make this another uh, rubber stamp approval without getting answers to these questions um, and a review by subject matter experts. Uh, I really hope that you'll take that into consideration because of the amount of uh, challenges that um, you've all been faced with the airport uh, by approving things that were not completely understood what the consequences would be. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments online or in the audience? Air seeing no movement and no hands online, I'm going to make a motion to close the public hearing on this item. Second. I have a motion by Board Member Heyer, a second by Board Member Ritchie to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Great. Okay, well, I've got quite a little list of questions here. I don't know if you were also taking notes, Brandon. <laughs> Do you, would you mind coming back up? And the first question had something to do with you know, understanding the red line area versus the taxing entity. Yeah, um, thank you. For... I was about ready to answer, but I thought I'll let the expert do it instead. Well, I was trying to keep up, so you might have to fill in um, some of the information. So, uh, Mr. Wilwright, I think, as you mentioned, asked, asked about the taxing entity. So, thank you, Brandon. Um, this is the proposed geographical boundary. Um, and so, all the parcel numbers, which are all listed in the project area plan, um, are, would be included within this broad yellow um, orange line on the map. Um, so, 
the, there's been a common theme through all the comments, so I'll just address it because I think Mr. Woolwright um, uh, initiated it, and that is um, who collects the taxes, what taxes are being um, levied, those kind of things. Uh, so the, what the um, RDA statute, state statute, allows the redevelopment agency to do is in working with other taxing entities sim similar to the ones that I've described, in this case the school district, the county, the city, and the central Weber sewer district, um, in working together then it's basically a joint agreement that the existing taxes that each one of those entities levy are collected by the RDA instead of by the individual taxing entities. So if you um, pull open your property tax notice that you get every year and you look, um, you'll see 10 to 12 taxing entities that each um, enact a levy on your property. And in Weber County, I think, um, you know, collectively that adds up to be somewhere around uh, three, four percent, I can't remember. Uh, Ogden City is, is a little over one percent. Um, and so there are no new taxes that are being levied by this action, by any of those entities. All it really is is an agreement between the RDA and those other taxing entities that um, allow the, the current levies that are being assessed or any future levies that might be assessed through the appropriate channels um, to flow to the RDA instead of to those participating taxing entities. Brandon, so, that would be above the baseline. Above the baseline. That's yeah. an important piece that you and need. And that's to what include. that's what Rich mentioned. Um, that two hundred eleven million dollar taxable valuation of this entire area is frozen, and the entities um, that are participating will continue to get uh, taxes from that valuation. Any additional valuation that the county assesses on individual properties, um, that will come to the RDA. So there are no new taxes, um, either directly or indirectly. That That's a falsehood. And then um, the, the clarification, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, that uh, Mr. Wilwright was saying, too, was something around, we're only talking about the land within these boundaries. Um, it's not like the whole city, for example, um, would be involved in this. It's just within these boundaries. That's right. So if you had, a, for instance, a property just adjacent, uh, say, to the north um, of that northern property line, um, does this have a pointer? I don't know. It doesn't work on the TV. It's on your the laptop. There you go. There. Yep. So let's say you had um, a property here. Then as you pay your property taxes, you you have the same assessed levies as the property owner on this side. It's just that when this, per, this um, property owner pays his taxes, uh, then it goes to a portion of that goes to the RDA. Uh, when this property owner pays his taxes, it goes to the individual taxing entities. That's the only difference. There is no additional levy. There is no new tax. Um, and I think that Mr. Wright has some additional questions, but you can probably follow up with him individually, right? Yeah, I'm happy to stay behind and talk to anybody. Uh, I know uh, Damon Burnham, our redevelopment manager, has, has uh, fielded um, uh, a lot of these same calls over the 30-day uh, public comment period, and so we've had a lot of these conversations already. Um, there was a, I think Mr. Wilwright had a, a comment about forfeiting property. Right, I was just going to mention that also. Yep. <laughs> but, um, Go ahead. Can I just ask real quick in there? I think one of the, one of the questions was, will the money collected by the RDA be invested solely in this area, or will it be invested mm -hmm. elsewhere in the city. Yeah, that was Travis so Pate's, Travis. I think, okay. comment. Okay. Um, so yeah. that was the next one. Um, yes, so uh, Mr. Pate referenced an anomaly um, in the state statute that allowed redevelopment agencies to collect what's called a haircut from other taxing districts to go for a singular purpose, and in this case, it was a rec center. So that anomaly was um, part of state law passed in 20, 2005, maybe? Yeah, and it was a short window. Yep, so it opened and it closed, and in our case, we had 10 taxing entities that we elected to be haircut districts that for the remaining life of, the, of that district, any new tax increment that was generated in those districts was used to service the debt at the CBD mall um, area, which is the junction. Um, that state law, or that that provision in state law no longer exists. And so right now, any um, tax increment that's generated within a project area boundary remains in the project area other than the 20% housing um, that I mentioned before. Can, can I add to that point a little bit? Um, 
also if if this if this area does not increase in value the 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 CRA or the RDA doesn't make any extra money that's right so it it has to increase the value in order for it to even work so it isn't going to it's not going to put the value somewhere else because it wouldn't it wouldn't work if you did that's right and then what about oh before you move on to a different question, are we going to? Oh, sure. I was just going to go back to the forfeiting property oh. question that we were still on, but you can do yours. Go ahead if you want oh, to sorry. do that. Because there was a couple questions from other people later too that had to do with the forfeiting property. Then, then let me before you okay. go on to that. Yeah. So why did you pick the boundary you picked? Good question. So that would come up later. Um, so we'll make sure we check that off the list. Um, so. As we looked at the boundary, um, the airport has, within the, the, the fence of the airport, so um, let's just call that the airport proper, uh, the, those uses are restricted, uh, mostly to aeronautical uses. Um, we felt it um, beneficial to have other parts that, other uh, properties that were contiguous to the airport. So um, just on the other side of uh, Airport Road, so over here. Um, and uh, also obviously on the other side of, of Hinkley. We felt it um, beneficial to have those properties included in the, in the area in the event that there is opportunity to develop um, airport support uses. So uh, if there's an industry or a company that has the need to be adjacent to an airport but not um, have to go through the, the process um, of being on the airport, then we wanted to provide an opportunity for landowners to um, and, and developers to develop ad airport adjacent or contiguous uses. And? and we're seeing that now in a couple of proposals um, that we're dealing with that, uh, in terms of rezoning and things where we're looking at um, properties that uh, don't have need for the airport but are beneficial to the airport in general and are airport contiguous. Can I, can I just also in, ask or clarify? So this RDA doesn't necessarily change any of the existing zoning in these areas. And so if this area that's on the uh, north side, that, that bubble area that's not, that's not presently zoned for airport usage, is that correct? Uh, you mean over here? Yeah. Yes, that's not presently zoned for air, uh, airport use. Okay. So it's so, but this RDA is not changing the zoning. That's right. On any of those so areas. on airport, we have a couple of zones: airport um, AI, mm -hmm. airport industrial, I think, and AC, airport commercial. Uh, I believe this is um, all commercial zoned here. Uh, so this enact right. the enactment of this plan would not change any of that. Any of that zoning. Is, is is the property right on top and bottom of that of that square? Is that Ogden property? Uh, I believe that, this is in Ogden, yeah. And then the bottom one? Um, no, this is not in Ogden. No, the, the over here. This one here? Yeah, right. Uh, no, this is not that's in Ogden. That's not, but the, the one on the top it is? Um, yes, I believe that's auto that's leave US Foods, isn't and it? U.S. Foods, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was a comment about that. Um, we're kind of jumping around, but you keep track of the questions. Okay, I'll do my best. I, I was um, going to mention, though, that that was... This was why you said there is no eminent domain, so there's no there's no provision to force anybody to do anything. That's right. So if people want to keep doing what they're doing, they can. Can. And um, so I guess only potentially, if it makes it more interest, if it draws more interest from others, it only raises their value uh, of what they're currently doing because it's becoming in more demand. Right, so right? if you're an existing property owner and you say you want to uh, expand and you're within this geographical boundary um, and uh, for some reason market conditions don't allow for it, uh, it's infeasible, um, you could come to the redevelopment agency, fill out an application and seek a tax increment incentive for, um, for assistance to help with the expansion if it's, if it's eligible based on the criteria that's in the plan. Uh, so that benefit inures to existing property owners. If you're a property owner that no longer wants to maintain the current use of your property and wants to sell it, and a new buyer wants to do something that might not be feasible, then tax inc increment could be used to augment um, that transaction as well. Thank you. But it's all based on 
um, willing partners. There is no compulsion here by any means. Um, there, there is no forfeiting of property. There is no indirect eminent domain or forfeiture, as Ms. Lewis mentioned, um, where the property tax gets so high that you no longer can afford to maintain the property, so somehow you have to forfeit it. That just does not exist. And as I mentioned in my presentation, we have managed at our highest level 22 of these districts. We have 13 now. And so we have um, a very extensive precedent of, of all of this working. This is not new to the city. Uh, I believe um, Ms. Castillo mentioned that we need uh, some kind of um, some kind of proof that these things are working. We have all the proof that we need in terms of um, the annual re report that I give every year. We look at our, our base year valuations, we look at the activities in the project areas, and we can see that in those project areas where activities have been slim to none, or in those haircut districts where the sole purpose of that district in its latter years was just to fund the CBD mall debt, we can see um, very poor results, but in the project areas, uh, especially since 2007, where we have been focused on reinvestment and using the tool in the way that it was intended, then we've seen exponential growth, three to four times more than uh, property values outside of those areas. Okay. Um, oh, do, you, do you want to go or do you want me to go? Yeah, why don't you tell me? Um, well, I was just going to try to, there were several people, and I think Teresa, you know, really got to the point on this, but there's several business owners that are very concerned not only about the forfeiting their property or how this impacts their business, but how does it benefit them and how, do they, how can they participate? You mentioned a little bit before um, about maybe they could apply for tax increment, but how else might they participate or how does it impact them? Um, so it just depends on what type of property owner uh, you are. If you're a property owner that just wants to continue to maintain status quo, you're happy with your business, you're happy with its location, you're happy with the condition of the business, um, all of this is largely invisible to you. You won't see an impact to your tax statement. Um, you could see impact to your valuation. And as a business owner, um, I've always... Uh, learned in business school that increasing your business valuation is a good thing. And so if you're a property owner and, a, or, a, and or a business owner, owner within the project area and valuations are increasing, and when I say valuations, I mean the, the taxable valuation of your real property and personal property um, assessed by the county. If your valuations are increasing because the comparables around you are increasing because of renewed investment, um, then that could have an effect on you uh, through your tax bill. Um, but it also is a wealth generator, right? We all, that's why we go into business. That's why we own assets is to create wealth. So as valuation increases, uh, associated liabilities sometimes increase with that as well. But the, the goal is to make sure that uh, the, the assets increase um, more than the liabilities. So that's a net positive. But if you're a property owner that is looking to make a change, uh, as I mentioned, an expansion or a sell or some kind of growth, a remodel, um, then we now have a financial tool to help that property owner uh, do, uh, accomplish those goals, a tool that without it we otherwise would not have and would not be able to help those types of property owners. I want to just piece of kind of clarification, which bridges a couple of these ideas that we've been talking about, is I remember from past conversations that even properties right outside of the district could actually benefit from some of these things too, right? Um, Depending. Kind of. Um, kind not of, okay. necessarily a direct uh, inducement to properties, but infrastructure that relates to adjacent right. properties, okay. yes. So, for instance, if there's a water line that came from outside of the property to, uh, or outside of the geographic boundary to the inside, tax increment could be used to pay for that water line, right. and then other properties outside of that project area could benefit from that. I was just kind of trying to think through the, you know, obviously this is not my expertise area either, so I'm just thinking through that, in my mind, um, by having your property included in the CRA, there's only a possible benefit to you as a business in case you want to do these kinds of things versus if we just drew the line right at Hinkley Drive, then you would only be really accessing if there's no infrastructure improvements. Right. But if our tax base valuation of the airport goes up, your property will also go up. And so you wouldn't have that possible benefit. 
Right, exactly. CRAs are meant to be all upside and little to no downside for the property owners that are inside of the project area. And I think we've proven that over and over and over again as we've managed up to 22 CRAs and RDAs. Um, I did want to speak to this notion of airport operations. Um, it's important to make the distinction that uh, tonight we're, um, we're asking you all to act as the RDA in the um, creation of this CRA plan. Airport operations is a city issue on the administrative side, right? And so um, I won't get into whether or not some of the concerns about Title VIII and leasing and um, some of those other things that might may or may not lead to the devaluation of the hangars. I won't get into that here. Um, I can say they are real concerns that we're um, constantly working on to address, but those are administrative issues on the city side and um, are not directly related to this proposal and really have little effect um, on what we do here. Uh, even if the CRA was enacted and the policies of the city were such that zero development happened because it was um, a disincentive, uh, then there would be no, uh, as I mentioned, no negative impact to the property owners and therefore probably no positive impact either if, this, if the city was, um, the city policies were prohibiting that. So there is a city side component um, uh, related to the administrative um, policies of the airport. We're working on those, uh, but again, that's not part of the discussion tonight in our minds. Yeah, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate the new conversations I've heard that are happening on that side. And the other piece that I kind of want to um, speak to, and it's in a couple of different comments, but specifically from Ed McKinney talking about, um, you were saying there's been a 30-day window for people to give feedback or have questions, but how else has um, either the advisory committee or other owners uh, in within this um, boundary, how have they been engaged? Um, I appreciate Ed's comments. What I said in the, the meeting to Ben was that we were reaching out to the airport advisory committee during the 30-day public comment period. It wasn't intended for them just to show up here potentially as others might. Um, so we reached out. We were trying to get a meeting with the advisory committee. We were unable to actually schedule an in-person meeting. So we transmitted the documents to the advisory committee and, and asked them to review them. They reviewed them and had no uh, sub substantial comments. Um, and so we feel like we've, we've got the um, input from the advisory committee. Uh, others that we have reached out to, um, we've had some discussions with uh, some hangar owners uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, but largely the way that we do these is that we publish the document, we provide equal access to everyone and allow them to come to us. Um, we, Like I mentioned, uh, Damon has fielded an, a, a handful of calls related to some of the similar questions that we're hearing tonight. Chair? Yes, please, go ahead. What, why were you unable to have a meeting, hold a meeting with the advisory committee? Uh, scheduling was an issue um, uh, to get a quorum, and we're in the middle of some um, changes with uh, those who are on the advisory committee uh, and new appointees, and so we're kind of working through that to make sure we get a quorum. So how, how about how long? This seems to be important to them, mm -hmm. right? So about how long did you guys try to figure out a meeting? Was it over a period of a week or two weeks or I, a month or? I believe it was um, actively trying to get scheduled for a yeah. couple of weeks, uh, but the advisory committee um, was aware of the plan at the time that we published it, so over 30 days. Um, the airport managers here, you can maybe mention how long you tried to schedule the meeting, but I, I wasn't in those conversations entirely. Well, I think we, we might need you in the mic. Yeah. We might need you in the mic. Oh, yeah. Do you right, mind Chair? stepping up? Yeah. Thank you. Just for the people online as well. Thank you. Yeah. Bryant Garrett, airport manager. And we were trying to, we had the original meeting scheduled for April 12th. And so we've been trying to get with everybody's schedule, but we also need a quorum to take any action to approve it. So it didn't really work out too well. I've got uh, three members that are transitioning off and uh, hopefully three candidates that will be coming for your approval sometime in the not too distant future. And we'll have, uh, I need four for a quorum. And it was hard to get the four remaining members together. 
So that's been the issue, but I think we rescheduled it at least three, four times since April 12th, and we still don't have a set date. Right. Thank you. Thanks. The, uh, the advisory committee has been great um, in trying to uh, be flexible, knowing that this is coming. They were willing to uh, review this you know, via email, as was the option that we had. So we, we are thankful for them for all the work that they do. Okay, and the last piece that I have on my notes, even though my notes are very messy, um, is there was a couple comments about um, competing with Falcon Hill and things at the Hill Air Force Base. I mean, is there anything that you'd like to comment about that? And yeah. MIDA. Oh, and MIDA. MIDA is a very um, interesting animal uh, in that it has some of the same rights and powers as a, a redevelopment agency does. Um, not as extensive and not to the degree that we have. And they're... Um, Although their powers are growing, they're specifically created for um, military installation, right? So it was specifically created to enhance um, the EUL, which is the extended use lease that was established uh, back in 1997 or 98. Uh, so yes, they are focused on creating private or public-private land uses uh, just outside the gate. Um, and they've done a, a wonderful job. So in terms of um, competition, uh, what we're seeing and what we're hearing from the uh, folks on base is that there's a, a number of obstacles that exist on base and at uh, Falcon Hill in terms of um, proximity, access, and cost. And so what we've tried to do is position ourselves with an alternate product to those people that want to try to solve for those kind of concerns. Um, would we be potentially going after uh, the same customer? Uh, I think that was the case when we did um, no the Northrop Grumman deal. They ended up building the Roy campus and we were actively pursuing them. The interesting thing that we learned from that is that because we didn't have the tools necessary to compete, that's why we lost. Um, and so that's why we're here today is to uh, help create the tools that help us be competitive. So we're not a head-to-head uh, -head competitor with Falcon Hill or Mida because it's an entirely different product. They can't do MRO there. Uh, they can't do FBO. They can't do cargo. You know, there's just a whole list of uses that are applicable to the airport that will never go to Falcon Hill. Uh, we likely wouldn't put large offices at Falcon Hill, or excuse me, at the airport, whereas they uh, would at Falcon Hill. So it's a different product for a different type of customer. And so there, while there is some crossover, the fact that we're here today is evidence that we do need better tools in our, in our toolkit to compete with things like that and other airports across the country. Great. Any other questions that I might have missed? Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe you touched upon this, but there's, uh, I, I don't remember who brought this up, but an old RDA boundary versus a new RDA band boundary, and which one? I'm glad you brought that up. I, I wish I had another slide. Um, so there's uh, some terminology that's important. Um, I mentioned that uh, a lot of what you heard tonight was administrative policy on the city side. Um, the, the terminology RDA is a, believe it or not, is a, mayor's policy that is related to a redevelopment area within the airport boundaries. And that is an unfortunate um, coincidence. Um, That's really funny. Yep. Uh, yeah. so, we, so the CRA is the RDA designation. The RDA is an area that has been elected through the mayor's policy that has designated a certain geographical boundary that is up for redevelopment. And so all that was was a signal to those property owners that um, the city has a policy that is targeting that area and therefore certain things um, can or can't happen. Um, while those two things overlap, again, one is on the RDA, one is on the city, they're actually entirely different. Um, the RDA or the CRA is by and large a financial tool to incentivize uh, future development. The city mayor's policy, RDA, is a policy that says that we are targeting this area for um, development, and therefore your hangar is subject to X, Y, and Z. So it's unfortunate crossover of terms that you're familiar with meaning one thing, but it actually means something different, but not relative to what we're talking about. Um, 
let me give an example. Maybe there's um, a potential development that is looking at a piece of property within that city side RDA area and is seeking um, financial incentives uh, from the RDA to build a, build a, uh, a new hangar. Um, in that case, both of those things would interact, right? The RDA, the CRA would kick in and uh, potentially be able to provide financial incentives. And then the, the mayor's policy RDA would kick in with whatever implications to those hangers uh, exist under that policy. But they overlap, they stack, they don't intermingle really. So, um, Brendan, remind me again, and I apologize. I know it was on, I think it was on your slides, but what are the next steps? If this um, is passed this evening, what are the next steps for people to contact you or get involved and understand it all better? Because they have a lot of other specific questions that I don't think we can answer necessarily tonight about their particular business. Um, so we're always open for discussion. I'm happy to make appointments with people that um, we can come out to their business and learn about what they do and help them understand the implications uh, beyond what we've described tonight. Um, we can have phone calls. Uh, we're, we're even happy to host a session, a learning session on the airport. Uh, we don't really have a terminal right now, so maybe we can um, figure out a, a common place. But uh, uh, we're happy to provide as much access to me and my staff as we as we need to to help people understand. Thanks. Terry, I had one more question. Yeah, I, I think somebody had asked, and I, if you can just give some clarity on this, on how we have the, the Ogden uh, Airport Master Plan and how this potentially goes against that. Can you address that? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that statement. Um, I think it... Uh, was referenced that if we have a master plan, we should follow it. I'm not sure what that um, means. Uh, the master plan, um, for instance, if you look, maybe, uh, so this is a, a snapshot of some of the things in the master plan. Um, if you look in this area, which is our Western area, uh, this has been an area of focus for us with infrastructure from an investment we, we received from the state. And so we're, uh, we're actively bringing in utilities to facilitate that very um, drawing uh, in terms of its shape and size. And so I, I feel like that the master plan, although like many master plans, isn't being followed perfectly and exactly, but it is a strong guidance to what we're doing. And the RDA, RDA the CRA project area plan is meant to augment that and facilitate the things that it calls for. Any other questions, comments? I just have a comment on the interlocal agreements. Mm -hmm. So you've talked to all of these in, uh, individual entities, correct? Not only have we talked to them, but they're all approved. And they're all approved. Mm -hmm. So obviously they see a value in doing this as well. That's right. right thank you. I, I think that, you know, the suggestion that you actually offered is a good one. Uh, that we ought to have, um, you know, an educational component and, you know, an understanding component. As I listened to the comments, there was an awful lot of things that I, I think we were talking apples and oranges for, with. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, these CRAs are, are very complicated. I mean, uh, as a new council member years ago, it took a while to figure out how this really works and how they benefit the city and how there's, you know, the the perceived downsides really aren't there um, and how and how it does work to be an upside especially for a city like ours that is largely built out and getting pretty old mm -hmm. in some in some areas um, it would be well if you if you took some time with folks that were interested um, we'd be happy to somewhere uh, and I'll to come too because I always need to read absolutely I you know I always <laughs> learn new things as I mentioned earlier that uh, the thing with the district and and that was, it, it functions differently there. And so I think it's, I'm always learning new stuff. So, but, but as far as, you know, to the, to the public that's here, um, we have talked about this for a long time and, and, it, and we have had a lot of education about CRAs and how they work and, uh, and those kind of things. And I, I don't feel like I've had the wool 
pulled over my eyes. I, I, I think I understand this pretty well. Um, and this, uh, and, and I see the benefit. Uh, I ran on this issue when I first ran for council is to, is to use the airport as a, as you know, to build up on that airport to make sure that it makes a, as a good city asset. We have a good airport manager now that, that sees that same vision. Everybody doesn't see things the same way, and maybe you're going to have to disagree with certain people on certain issues. But, but largely, I think uh, you know our airport is is doing well. Um, I wish it did better in some areas, but uh, we continue to work on that. Um, but yeah, I, I really hope you'll have that uh, that instructional time absolutely um, soon. So. If I may, Chair, I, you, you sparked a thought. Um, so what better uh, way to see potential future performance than look at past performance, right? And I mentioned that out of the 25 RDAs that I've managed in my career here, 22 being the most prevalent. Uh, we lost a few the first couple of years, and now we're down to 13. We haven't always had well-performing RDAs um, or whatever acronym you want to give them. Um, and that's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but uh, in the time that I've been here, um, our, our RDAs or CRAs are well performing. Uh, this was created in 2005. Um, this was, again, to facilitate development, both development that has occurred and that hasn't occurred. But if you look at some of the numbers, the base taxable value in 2005 was $150,000. I don't know what I did. <laughs> there we go. Um, so that that little polygon there in gray was valued at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in two thousand and five. Uh, that means that all of the taxing entities that ha that levied a tax on that property um, was uh, it, it only had a value of one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. At the closure of this, um, this was taken uh, in twenty twenty one. So there would have been one more year. But uh, in the closure of the project area, the, that same geographical boundary was valued at $19 million, a little, a little under in this report, but once we got the final report. And so the question is, would that same geographical boundary have grown to that extent in the same amount of time without the investment that was given? And in this case, we collected $2.8 million. And so for an investment of $2.8 million between 20, 2005 and uh, 2021, we gained $19 million. And um, it was the, the thesis of the people who created this RDA, I didn't do it, that without that investment, then in that same period of time, that property would have never reached that same valuation. Um, and we've done that study before. We've looked at property and their taxable values over a period of time uh, without an RDA or with an RDA, and it's always, um, uh, more, especially in the cases of RDAs that were created from 2007 forward. So this is a really good example of how they work. Um, and uh, in this case, this money was um, used to, de to incentivize the Kemp Center, and that's a wonderful place that provides a, a great service to the, to the airport even, even today. We were thinking that would be a good place for the meeting. I'll ask them. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, Chair, because Please, you asked earlier, and I and I and I miss what you said, Brian, and I apologize. But you asked about the the outreach that happened, and I just I just couldn't I I, I miss what you said, and I apologize. But can you tell me again, real quick, what what kind of outreach happened? So we did a couple of things, as as uh, um, Bryant mentioned, we tried to get with the airport advisory yeah. group. Um, that ended up being a uh, email review. Um, over the last couple of weeks from them. Uh, we weren't able to meet face-to-face. -face. We met with uh, four or five hangar owners um, to discuss uh, uh, the CRA and, and how it relates to some of the main concerns that you've heard tonight with Title VIII and the leasing. And we fielded um, a number of calls from people that have uh, called in over the 30-day public comment period. Okay. We published a plan um, online and um, made it available in the office. Uh, per state statute, and um, as I mentioned, we made ourselves accessible to any and all questions. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, any other comments or questions? And I'd be happy to consider a motion. So I, I, I do have one, one, one mm -hmm. last comment. Um, so what is the urgency to approve these today? I'm curious about the people that are here and that have questions and that um, even though we think this is a good thing in their minds, they're not sure. And I'm just curious if these um, follow up with, uh, with, with our, our residents should happen before we approve these. And I'm just, sure. I'm just curious. I think it probably is related to the public hearing that it was posted that we have the public hearing. Do we have to repost if we delay? <coughs> so it was, um, you know, noticed to everyone that this was the public hearing. So then we'd have to re-notice. Okay. If, if it's noticed as a public hearing, I think if you could just put it on the agenda and take public input, that wouldn't need to be noticed except through the regular. Okay. Uh, Whenever agenda. I try to respond, it's the wrong one, so. <laughs> Say that again, Janine. <laughs> this was noticed as a legal public hearing. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> um, so, but it, but we often put things on the agenda and just take public input, right? And so the notification of the posting of the agenda becomes the notification. So they wouldn't get mailings again like they did. Mm. Right. So, yeah, that's before. the only thing that I think is the rush. Yeah, but but I mean, so what I'm saying is, tonight we we are being presented with the with the option of adopting these, right? And and if we if we don't adopt it because we're saying we would like the administration to have more 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 interaction, then it just comes back again whenever yeah. we wanted to come back to approve it. I think so. I think that's what she's saying. Yeah. Right? So you could just continue it to a date certain. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do that. I just didn't know if it had to be noticed again as a public. That's right. It. So, so I'm just curious, and I don't know if this is a question for the administration again. I wonder what the rush is. I, I again, I, I get it. I get it that we, like, like Councilmember Heyer said, that we understand to some extent how the CRAs work, and I and I agree. I I I, I support these these tool these 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 districts and. But I know that we probably have a lot of people that are uneasy, and I'm, I'm just curious what's yeah. what's the possibility there to say? What's, I mean, what's the rush? What's what's the, what's what's sure. what's the possibility? Brandon, do you want to respond, or do you want to respond, Mark? <coughs> so, uh, if you all elect tonight to uh, postpone this, or however you choose to do that. Um, we would be happy to uh, re-engage with the public in any way that's uh, appropriate. Uh, there's, a, there's a pretty pres prescriptive state process that we follow, um, and we tend to uh, uh, address all of the comments that we receive uh, during that period that's allotted for um, in state law. And so we've had a chance to do that. We've, we've addressed those same things tonight. If that's inadequate, then we're happy to, to um, catch up otherwise sure and how long do you think it would take to uh, meet, have the meeting with the public or the advisory committee? well again I mean that's uh, that's uh, an ambiguous thing so we could have an event as I mentioned uh, already we could have a single event um, uh, we wouldn't have the same posting uh, so we would uh, try to figure out how to make that um, available, but then we would have the ability at that single event to do exactly what we've done here. There wouldn't be any new information. There wouldn't be any new concerns that I would uh, predict. I think it would be the same conversation that we've had. Um, there might be a better level of understanding. Uh, uh, you said earlier that you are happy to talk to people and meet with people and go to people's businesses. That that's, sounds a little different than a single event. But I appreciate it if, if if whatever possibilities there might be, and what I'm interested in personally is in honoring the people that came here tonight, and, and that I don't know what's going through their minds, because we don't have a, a setup where we allow people to give us feedback after we answer their questions. So in their minds, they might be thinking, well, but what about these? What about that? And to me, that's just very, it's just, 
it's it, I don't like that, right? So if it was imminent that we uh, that we approve this, I personally would say I feel comfortable. Honestly, I I I, I it took me a while also to get it R, uh, RDAs, but in in you know as 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 respect to our constituents, our citizens. I don't see what's wrong with if there is no the imminent urgency, then I don't see what's wrong with taking a few more weeks and reaching out at least to the group that came here and just, you know, in, interact with them. That's just me. I don't have a and the advisory committee also, I'm sorry, because uh, approving something like this without advice from an advisory board to me sounds a little weird. Well, I'm, I'm happy to read the email to you if you uh, actually need to hear from them specifically. There's a there's an email from the chair, Guy Latender, that says that there are no concerns from the advisory committee. But Ed McKinney is not on the board anymore? No. Okay. No. That was just confusing. And I would add that we, as an administration, would encourage you to take action tonight. I think we need to move forward. We've got a, a lot of things going. We've spent a lot of money to try and get the airport ready for d new development and we've been talking to our partners who agreed to you know the school district the county etc for a long period of time this wasn't just we did this last week or the week before with them we've been doing this with them for a considerable amount of time so i i mean my f my personal feeling is i think we could do all this outreach and we would come back and you would hear the very same thing you heard tonight so, I, I mean, our encouragement would be to take action tonight. We don't have one vote, but that would be our encouragement. So you're saying that if we take action, then you would still do the follow-up later, and you're saying you would prefer us to table this for two weeks or Correct. date certain. Correct. Let some of that interaction happen and then come At back. least with the folks that came here tonight. Correct. Other council members? I'm kind of wondering what would be different in two weeks myself i i don't you know i think that there was a lot of people that had concerns and complaints that they brought to our attention that really had nothing to do with the cra uh, or i also am kind of concerned that there are there are some people with motives to kind of fog the issue um which has happened here tonight that um to kind of cloud the thing and make it make everybody think that we don't know what we're doing and that we're going into uncharted territory and making silly mistakes and and why would we do that? And, and, and I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I, I just don't, don't know what would be any different other than, you know, those things getting a little more traction. I, 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 do, I do sympathize with what you're saying. I, I mean, I would like, it would be really nice if we could get everybody uh, doing kumbaya all the time, but it, it doesn't really happen that way. And and that's kind of what I was thinking. I appreciate um, you you mentioning that. I I understand where you're coming from, um, but on the on the other side, I I truly appreciate Brandon's willingness to meet with anyone and everyone um, because I I do believe that there are a wide range of of questions or concerns. Um, I think some of those had to do with, with the CRA and some of them just had to do with airport concerns as a, as, as a whole. Um, but I, I appreciate Brandon being willing to meet with, with everyone and um, I, I believe that speaks volumes to the administration, the administration's willingness to be open and upfront about what we're trying to do, what our plan and our vision at the airport is. Um, I, I understand the difficulty of trying to get different groups and different people and having a quorum and trying to get everyone coordinated. And I appreciate um, airport manager um, Bryant's attempts in that. And I, I just feel like I, I agree with, with council member Heyer. I, 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 I don't see much changing in the, in, in two weeks. Um, I, I, I strongly would encourage not only Brandon to reach out, but for, for those here and those at the airport to reach out to Brandon also. Um, I think Brandon has the information and the, the willingness to, to share that information. So I, I, I feel very comfortable moving forward tonight. 
And I'd be happy to meet with people too. Yeah. Right. I, I think I would like to see the email from the, the airport of, or the advisory committee. Be, if we can send that along, that'd be great to hear. I, I think for me, um, based on what we've we've talked about tonight, I feel I feel okay to proceed, and I and I again echo what Bart says in terms of um, that transparency and openness to meet. I think that's a great, I think that's important as well as part of this. But I don't know that um, anything changes for me in the next couple of weeks. I, and I, but not to discount what you're saying, Councilmember Ruiz, um, about honoring those who have come here tonight. And I think that we can we can do both. I I hope so. We can do both. Uh, on another note, have you reached out to Mayor uh, Dandoy? Yes, we're in um, frequent conversations with him. He's he's one of the ones on the airport advisory committee that got the got the presentation. He's still on the committee, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, well, that's what I wanted to look at. It. You know, the Weber County. That's the three commissioners that have approved this. Uh, August School District. That's the the school board members that have that have looked at this and approved it. Um, Central Weber Sewer, there's like 13 or 14, many of the mayors in our county mm -hmm. are on that, on that board have, uh, have received this, uh, this, uh, presentation, looked at it and approved it. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, hopefully that'll carry a little weight with people that are a little concerned. Well, you know. I was going to speak for you, but you go ahead. Uh, you know, I I agree with all of you. I would hope that we had a process to allow somehow the people that come and speak to us to <laughs> give, give us their thoughts after we deliberated. Because to me, that's very disrespectful mm -hmm. that we don't allow people to do that. That is my issue. Uh, but this is a democracy, and you all want to move forward, and I, I think this is a good thing. I agree. But I find it very frustrating if I were sitting on that chair, and I have questions, and they answer my questions, and I don't have an opportunity to follow up before there's going to be a vote. And then I go home, and I'm, I'm all confused and worried, and I don't know what's going to happen. Follow-up is going to be great. But uh, again, I, I, I appreciate entertaining the, the idea and, and the, the, the possibility, and you know, I think we should move forward. It's good. Thank you. Maybe, maybe, maybe we want to entertain a way to give people a chance to ask follow-up questions when, when, when we're in this setting uh, down the road at some point. Okay. Right. Well, would anybody like to make a motion? Sure, Madam, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion that we. Um, adopt resolution 2023-11. Second. We have a motion by board member Heyer, a second by board member Blair to adopt proposed resolution 2023-11. It's a roll call vote. Board member Blair? Aye. Board member Heyer? Aye. Board member Lopez? No. Board member White? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Would you like to make a comment, Board Member Lopez? Uh, I just, just, I'll repeat what I just said. <laughs> I just hope, really hope. When I, when I, when I was elected on my first term um, for the first year or two, um, I was very, uh, I was, I was very loud and passionate and forceful to try to figure out ways on how we can interact with people when they come to these chambers. And I understand that it's not easy, but I don't think it's impossible either. And I don't think that we do a good enough job to figure out how to do it. And so uh, really, that's just why I voted no. I, I think it's a good project. Uh, and I, I do appreciate the administration uh, doing these projects. I, I, I think they they brought a lot of good to our city, but I think our our interactions with our constituents, the people that elect us, the people that we work for, sometimes are a little condescending. But thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I'd be happy to take another motion. 
Chair, I would make a motion that we adopt proposed resolution 2023-12. Second. I have a motion by board member Blair, a second by board member Heyer to adopt proposed resolution 2023-12. This is a roll call vote. Board member Heyer. Aye. Board member Lopez. No. Board member White. Aye. Board member Blair. Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie. Aye. Chair Chaburka. Aye. And that passes. Would, you like, would anybody no. like to make a comment? Okay. Oh. All righty. Chair, I'd make a motion that we uh, adopt resolution 2023-13. Second. I have a motion by board member Heyer, a second by Vice Chair Ritchie to adopt proposed resolution 2023-13. This is also a roll call vote. Board member Lopez? No. Board member White? Aye. Board member Blair? Aye. Board member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Truburka? Aye. And that passes. Chair, I make a motion we adopt proposed resolution 2023-14. Second. We have a motion by Vice Chair Ritchie, a second by Board Member Blair to adopt proposed resolution 2023-14. This is also a roll call vote. Board Member White? Aye. Board Member Blair? Aye. Board Member Heyer? Aye. Board Member Lopez? No. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Chair, I'd make the motion that we adopt re proposed resolution 2023-15. Second. I have a motion by board member Heyer, a second by board member Blair to adopt proposed resolution 2023-15. This is also a roll call vote. Board member Blair? Aye. Board member Heyer? Aye. Board member Lopez? No. Board member White? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you, everyone. Up next, we have public comments. Now, this will be the only um, general public comment period this evening. Um, we do have a city council meeting following, but it doesn't have public comment on it. Um, although there is a public input um, portion in our public hearing about the budget. But if you'd like to make comment to the board or the council, this is your opportunity to re address us regarding any concerns or ideas on any topic. Um, please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes to speak. Hi, Travis Pate, Ogden resident. I like to the dynamic is we do have public input in the next one, but with regards to the budget, uh, we're looking at possibly approving $750,000 for a, a new general plan and $750,000 for a consultant slash uh, redo of the general plan, and yet there's been no accountability for the current general plan. As you read through the general plan, off to the right-hand side, it says high priority, and it says responsibility is city council, landmarks, planning commission, um, we might even say ad airport advisory committee, <laughs> any of those types of things that say high priority, and yet there's not really an accountability on those. There, it's a prior, I, I would say go ahead and approve the budget, but have it, so to speak, locked that that accountability has to come forth before the administration can spend it. It can be appropriated, and it can be set aside in the, in the account uh, towards creating a general plan. But if we're just getting one more document to just put on the shelf and ignore, such as we have an airport advisory committee, and yet only one individual here on the, on the RDA board said, I would like to actually have the information prior to voting on this from the airport advisory committee. Well, we have an email. That's not a quorum. <laughs> so just getting an email from an individual a group that we actually have, so to speak, paid, even though they're all volunteers, to be the professionals in this category, and yet they're not represented because they can't get a quorum since April. Two weeks, we, in two weeks, we could have possibly had the quorum. We could have those individual, the new members on board. They could vote. They could have an opportunity to give the opinion to, the, to this board. And yet, no, let's move ahead because there were things said that were 
that were meant to confuse the issue. I don't believe anything said tonight was here to confuse the issue of, an, uh, of the airport CRA. And look at the map. Why is the bottom portion of the airport not there? Are we planning something else at the end of the runway? Why is the full airport boundary not in the map? I mean, there's just a lot of things that are left undone that, that administration continues to bring to you, such as the standard examiner and a public noticing, and you guys ask specifically, hey, please give us the, circular, the circulation. Please give us the notice. And they come and present it to you anyway, half done. Wait, why are they ignoring this body? We want the money, but uh, hmm, let's not, let's not have any accountability for the money and, or for accountability for your questions. It's complete disrespect. It's a, it's a non-elected official presenting to elected officials their opinion for how the direction of the city goes. And then the haircut tax that, oh yes, this, well there should still be an accountability for that haircut tax, even if it's not currently available. Uh, we have $1.9 million for Union Square Phase 2, but we didn't put that up to a public bid. So I think even this has to be readdressed um, that says we can't just, any unsolicited that comes to Ogden City, you guys have to have the first approval. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Wow, he's tall. <laughs> Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, Council Member White brought up a very good question. Uh, have all of the entities signed off on this, school district and county? Now, I, I, I don't know about the other entity, but um, I do know that there are three phrases that y'all should really hear, and they are due diligence, fiscal impact, and feasibility study. And these are the words that are suggested by the Utah State Legislative Auditor, and they want those words and phrases used. They want those reports. Those uh, due diligence, fiscal impact, and feasibility study report are also the words that Urban 3 and Joe Minicosi recommended to you to be used when developing and using TIF and the CRA. And due diligence, fiscal impact, and economic feasibility study are also the words that the Economic Development Director of Weber County wants to hear and is currently changing their rules for what are they doing from here on out. Because in answer to Council Member White's question, those interlocal agreements were signed before the new Economic Development Director of Weber County is there. They have to say yes. The school district signed on because the county signed on and the county hired someone with extensive experience to, for economic development who actually holds credentials in economic development and has a consulting company that goes nationwide to teach other cities how to do that. And I just, I just don't understand how one would go all in and continue to release money and do development, which again, I am not against. I am not against TIF. I am not against economic development. I am not against developers. A lot of people have confu uh, referred to me as being too pro-developer, which is ironic. Um, but we're moving forward without having all of the voices at the table. And I also find it really interesting that uh, Mr. Cooper didn't tell you how Mayor Dandoy felt. He said, we're in discussions with Mayor Dandoy. I've spoken with Mayor Dandoy, and I will not speak for Mayor Dandoy, but I would think that before you're doing something with property that he owns as a city, and he's responsible for managing as a city, that you would hear his opinion and I, I really do um, appreciate all the questions that were asked. They were very thoughtful. I just wish that we would make sure that we're insisting on due diligence reports, fiscal impact reports, and feasibility studies before we give away our money. Good evening, Teresa Bramwell. Uh, this meeting's been interesting for me. Uh, I think the airport has a little bit in common with not my neighborhood at 25th and Monroe. 
Um, it's been in a state of flux and limbo for a very long time. Uh, years, more than five years, probably a decade. Um, the redevelopment agencies had their hands all over it for a very long time, uh, probably a decade. Um, there have been agreements, there have been leases, there have been, you know, a lot of different things that were supposed to happen. Nothing's really happened. It's been very frustrating. Um, <laughs> And so I, I'm brought back to think about my neighborhood at 25th and Monroe. Um, and I wonder, because the redevelopment agency uh, back in 2015 established my neighborhood at 25th and Monroe as a redevelopment area. Eminent domain was on the table then uh, for nine blocks of single family homes. Um, those single-family homeowners hired an attorney and said, we don't want to be eminent domained. Uh, it, we want to have a say. We want to be, be a part of the action. We want to have control over our, our own private property. So I don't know, I wasn't really here and coming to this, these meetings every week back in 2015 when that happened, but I know that absolutely nothing has happened since then. And my neighborhood has gone downhill and downhill and downhill and downhill to the point where now it's just literally a crime infested ghetto. The poverty is, there's nothing. It's, it's dirt. And nothing's happening. Nobody can sell anything. It's entirely in limbo. So I, I worry about what happens with the airport. Because what I've seen when the redevelopment agency gets their hands on property, that it just becomes a, 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 a cash cow dump that nobody wants to be there. Um, that's what my neighborhood's become. I'm waiting for the day in which the, the grand scheme is going to come into view and we all know what's happening and my neighborhood is catapulted into some sort of functional, money-making, anything really, because right now it's dirt. And I would love to know what Brandon Cooper's plans are for my neighborhood and I would love to have a say in it. And that's why I've been coming to these meetings for probably eight months now, and I haven't heard one word about anything positive. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Austin Raymond, um, Ogden City resident, I hope. Um, and I apologize if what I'm bringing up has been uh, addressed more fully since I've been down with an illness, so stuff I normally follow has been difficult for me to follow with. Um, but I, I am concerned, uh, as with some of what was talked about in this meeting, <clears throat> and Council Member Lope has brought up, of the transparency and the perception of integrity when it comes to what Ogden City does writ large, um, especially for me, uh, the matter of the point system with the police, police department has been concerning. I find it harder to trust what the police department might be doing, and I say this as someone who greatly respects uh, the police and the work that they do and the difficulties they face, but quite frankly it seems like there is something disingenuous going on there to avoid paying the police department more, and the city's trying to do a little magic trick on all of us and say, ignore what's going on behind the curtain, we promise it's good, and I find it very uh, unconvincing. Uh, clearly the state finds it unconvincing as well and I would wish to see from the city more work to improve the perception of integrity given to the people and the transparency behind what is going on because right now with so much of what the city does it just doesn't come off well and as my father often likes to joke corruption in Ogden City who would have guessed? I'm not saying there is corruption, and I'm not implying or accusing any of you of corruption, but when you are able to create the environment that such things can be perceived, I find that deeply troubling. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you're feeling better. Any other comments? 
Um, Laura Lewis, Ogden City resident. I just wanted to thank Councilman Lopez because you summed it up perfectly how we all feel. We come here week after week hoping that you will listen to us. And while you all may be very confident in what you're doing because you get a lot more information than we do, um, every one of these projects is a last minute thing. We gotta get it done, gotta get it done. What would it really have hurt two weeks to have those people meet with Brandon to where they felt confident that they knew what the future of their property was going to be. And that's the way I walk out of here every time you guys vote on something significant, is that nobody listens to us. We take time out of our schedules every week to show up here because we care about what's happening. And we feel like we should have a voice because it's not your city, it's ours. And we would like someone to start listening to us. Please, thank you. Good evening. My name is Brant Berkland. I live on 20, 29th Street in Ogden. Um, I'm here to talk to you about concerns I have about the speed on that street specifically and speeds in our neighborhood in general, in neighborhoods in general. Um, I've shared these concerns with multiple people at the city, including staff at Public Works, Ogden P Police Department, and even emailed council members. I'd like to thank Councilmember Nadalski for returning my email within days and then uh, prompting a, a follow-up phone call. We had a really nice conversation about uh, the concerns. He came out, took a look at things. I really appreciate him, him doing that. Um, I also appreciate that the city put in a, a stop sign, a single stop sign. Um, it's about a mile, about half mile stretch downhill um, on, on Taylor and 29th Street. That was, uh, that was a great thing the city did, but unfortunately it hasn't made much of a difference. The reason I came specifically today is um, Ogden High is holding a track camp uh, right now. So you have like 50 kids that are all excited to go run on the track. And meanwhile, you have people going through 40 miles an hour, almost taking out said kids, which I saw with my own eyes this morning. Um, so the point is something needs to change and nothing has changed. So what I, what I wanna do is just suggest a couple of, well, one other thing, um, there's also potholes on the street and I understand there's potholes everywhere. It's a, it's a big task to repair potholes. But for some reason, they've stuck these cones or so, something on the street. They've been there for two and a half months People swerve around them. They almost hit cars, kids, dogs. I mean, they got to do something about that. It's insane that it's about two and a half months that there's still cones in potholes on 29th Street. Um, so I look at this from two, two fronts. As a resident, it's really disheartening to see kids almost hit and people driving 40, 45 miles an hour in neighborhoods. That's, as a resident, I don't, I'm, I'm not okay with that personally. I hope you guys aren't okay with it either. <laughs> I'm not sure about, to be completely fair, about the, the public works or police department. I've shared these concerns multiple times with them and nothing's happened. Um, I'll give them this, the benefit of the doubt that they actually do care, but the action hasn't followed that up. Um, but I'm also a trained urban planner. I worked for 13 years as an urban planner. I went to school for urban planning. I understand how cities are designed and should function. So as a professional, I see this and it's, it's really disheartening to see the, the negligence in how we've, how we have not, um, how we allowed our streets to be overtaken by speed. And it's not just cars, like you know, it's 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 buses, and it's not just my street; it's every street. And so, you know, my fear is something is going to happen. Like nothing has happened, but it's a it's a ticking time bomb. It's high speed everywhere, all over the place, all the time. And there's very easy solutions. I think we could encourage our public works department to have an open mind. I'd be happy to meet anybody, anytime, any place on any street in Ogden and, and walk through my professional opinion. Sit out and watch cars. You, you don't have to take my word for it, um, but something needs to be done and done soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Any other comments in chambers? We have a couple online. What happened on your run? Yeah. <laughs> You're moving kind of slowly. Of getting it replaced next month. Oh. <laughs> I try to hide it, apparently not well. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, good evening, uh, council, 
administration. First of all, thanks for the opportunity. And I'm changing subjects. This is about the budget. Sure. Do you want to state your name for the record? John Thompson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in the city bulletin and your commentary, so I appreciate the uh, public uh, notice to participate in this project. Uh, I'm, to, I'm here uh, about my letter, which I'm told you all received, and the only thing I will mention from it is that I'm asking for $5,000, again, for the John Moses Browning Firearms Museum. Uh, and the other things I want to say is what I did not put in the letter. And basically, uh, first of all, is that I apologize because if I was smart, because it seems this year went by as I, I'm here again this year, but I should have tried to get with the administration and put it in their budget proposal. So I'm behind the curve. I'm late. I hope I'm not too late. Uh, I don't want to detract from the Mercy car, uh, but my feelings on the Mercy car is basically to the effect that John Moses Browning had a little bit more significance to this city and to Utah and the world than the Mercy car. Uh, that thing, and I won't go into why I'm against it, but basically uh, you're asking for a piece of undocumented railroad history for a railroad car that didn't travel a foot on a U.S. railroad line, and here we have it. I do a support that it's city property, so we should take care of it. I just think that you are or we are kind of ignoring something we've had here in John Moses Browning and his firearms. He's going to be uh, dead in three years, a hundred years. That means his last gun invented is going to be a hundred years old. But the others, starting in 1878, are a little bit older than that. And here we are with the points I made in my letter, that why I think this is, if not equally deserving, more deserving to get some specific money to try to get this museum back up to the standard and the uh, prominence that I believe it should have. So I don't, again, I'm not taking away from the MERS car. I'd just like to see that uh, the Browning uh, Firearms Museum gets a little funding and reading the agendas today, so I'm not sure if that's from the amendment for the Mercy car for this year's budget or going into next year's or whatever, but that's my request, so I thank you for it. Thank you. Any other comments in chambers? Okay, we'll go online with Renee Felker. Hello? I'm Renee. I'm Renee Falker, Ogden City resident, uh, hangar owner at the airport. Um, simple point I want to bring up. Y'all made the decision to go ahead with the CRA, which I don't disagree with, but the financial basis of it was on a baseline of 2020 taxes at the airport. And that basis is great because it's going to take us years and years and years to get back to even on that because the hangars have been depreciated so much by actions of the city council and of the city itself. So whatever you do, you need to go put some attention on the airport and figure out what it is, or you're just creating a big hole and the poor uh, development guys are gonna be in there saying, but we haven't earned any income, so we can't give any grants. We can't improve anything because the basis for the tax difference is going down. And I don't see any way it goes up unless something drastically changes with Title VIII. I know my hangar becomes city property or I remove it one way or the other at the end of the decade. So every year a chunk of it, my value goes down and there's nothing to replace it in those areas. Anyway, that's what I had to say. Thank you. Heath Sato. Hi, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, um, the previous commenter said something about the potholes everywhere and 
other issues with our infrastructure, and I'll get to that. But first, I'd like to address Mr. Cooper's statement that what I said about indirect ta taxes was a, quote, falsehood. Um, I resent that remark since it's not. Um, I also regret that Council Member Heyer felt the need to represent some of the public's comments as intentionally fogging the issue. We live here, we're impacted by these things, we're not paid to attend these meetings, our concerns are not faceless. I don't know if it's a lack of understanding or not, but TIF is not a 100% free lunch. Otherwise, we just TIF the entire country with this magical tool with zero downsides. It is a very useful tool. TIF is great for giving a blighted property a hand up when nobody else will touch it. But it's not the only tool we have, and not all these properties are even remotely blight that nobody wants to purchase themselves. I've given you multiple examples of that. And we're paying for these TIF packages through greater strain on our infrastructure and schools as we wait for that property tax money to come in way on down the road. There's no free lunch. I'd like a more balanced explanation from our CED director. It doesn't affect the schools. It doesn't affect the school system kids in his neighborhood go to. It affects our school system. It affects our sewers where we live, our roads, our sidewalks. We're footing the bill in the meantime to either repair and replace the infrastructure or live with the extra damage due to the extra strain on our infrastructure that's not being paid for for a long time. There's no free lunch, and I would like some of you to at least ask for an explanation of the downsides. If there were no downsides, we'd just tip the whole city. Thanks. Up next is Ed McKinney. You hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, Ed McKinney in Utah. First of all, I'd like to sincerely thank Council Member Lopez. Uh, we need more of you on the City Council. Um, secondly, twice now we've heard from business development, we're not here to talk about Title VIII uh, and leases uh, because that's the admin side. Um, these are city contracts that are enablers or disablers for the CRA and RDA. Uh, so speaking for the airport community, uh, when can we meet on this uh, to take you up on your offer? It's a very critical and stressful uh, situation as it relates to these contracts. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Not seeing any. Any comments from the executive director? Th thank you. <clears throat> um, a couple of comments on um, Teresa Bramwell. I hope I got your name right. Uh, on her property area. We proposed a property area and then we pulled it back. We never did institute a CRA or RDA at the time. So there is no CRA or, or RDA in her, in her area. There might be in the future, but there isn't currently. Um, I thought it was interesting that today we got um, encouraged to do more police enforcement and a couple of weeks ago we were being told that we're forcing our officers to go write tickets. I, you know, can't have it all the ways, um, and we're trying our very best to, to enforce as good as we can with the force that we have. I don't know that you could add, you could add 100 or more officers, and you're not going to enforce all the streets where there's little kids that live. We'd like to, but I, that's an impossibility. And today, when, it, when our officers were put to a task of um, uh, officer-involved shooting, um, I think I just want to pay some tribute to the officers who were involved. Um, uh, more detail will be coming out. I only know so much I've been in this meeting along with you, although I kept running out, which I appreciate your patience with me. But uh, we have an officer that's in the hospital. Um, our prayers are with him and his family, hoping that he recovers. Um, and so the officers do more than just tickets, but they, they try and do as much as they can. Um, I will talk to the police about the enforcement on 30th That's um, um, and other roads, 29th, et cetera. There's a lot of issues around the high school that um, make it sometimes difficult. 
the potholes on 29th with the cones, uh, that's un unacceptable. I will have somebody up there tomorrow. We are working hard. We have um, two or three crews right now. That's all they're doing is potholes. That's all they've done since April 1. We are thinking about outsourcing a company to come in and help us. There's just so many. And we're talking to our neighboring cities, the state, everyone else is having the very same problem with potholes. I hope people will will do their very best to avoid them and then hopefully have patience that we're going to get to them as, as quick as we can. But this was a hard winter on the streets everywhere. So we're doing our best there. Um, I appreciated the comments through um, the CRA. Uh, I, RDAs and CRAs are, are sometimes challenging to understand. And um, I think one of the things that's lost um, that probably the school district and the county and others understand is if we don't do some of these investment areas, um, then there is no new property tax that's going to come to the school district or the county or the other entities. And it's really important, I think, that they understand the concept. Um, they all realize the gain out of uh, BDO and, and when that, that RDA expired. Um, uh, the Newgate Mall was an RDA once upon a time. It was actually the first RDA that, it, that w was, was terminated early because it had reached its goal. There are, there are really good things that happen that create new property tax. Um, and I think these entities that work with us understand the concept of investing some of that property tax over a period of time and then afterwards it comes to them. Um, we're trying to generate new tax to all of these entities in what we're doing. And, and I compliment our economic development staff. They're, they're in the front lines. They're, they're, the bullets are whizzing past their heads on a, on a regular basis. They, they work hard. They do their best they can. Um, and I think that they're, we're seeing the influence of that. Um, our our uh, revenue has gone up dramatically in the last 23 years. Uh, the city has changed dramatically in the last 23 years. I, I was um, invited to speak on a podcast the other day, and one of the things that I said was the amount of change I have seen in the time I have been here at the city is remarkable. Uh, this is not the same city that I was elected um, to the city council in, in 2001, 2002. It's not the same city that I served on the planning commission with council member Heyer. Uh, before that, um, the city has dramatically changed, and a lot of it's been because of the the investment of this city in trying to make it better in, for the future. Um, there's been a lot of people who have sat in your seats o over the last 23 years who have contributed to that. You certainly have contributed to that, and I thank you. I appreciate what you have done to help this great city continue to grow. That's all the comments I have tonight. Thanks. Thank you. And I appreciated that the mayor was at the hospital uh, with the officer as well. So. He's where he should be tonight. Yeah, we appreciate that. Any other comments? Just want to quickly acknowledge and uh, let you know, uh, Mr. Justin, I agree with your comments about RDAs and CRAs. I completely agree with you. Uh, so my my earlier votes, again, were really not, you know, I won't repeat myself. I just, I just want to, want to say that I agree with you. Yeah. Any other comments from board members? Chair, I, I've been thinking about what Councilmember Lopez said with regards to um, the, the circumstance we find ourselves in. And, uh, we have been, you know, I, I guess the, the, the way it's, it works is we start a thing, you know, way back yonder, and we start doing things, and we get educated and we get do our due diligence and our research and all of the things that, that, that makes this happen. And it all is in the public eye, except some of the public isn't watching at that time. They come after they get their notice. Or they get, a, they get, they get, they raise their attention when they get their notice, and and I, 
I, I, it's been a concern for me too. It would be nice if we could figure out a way to, to kind of notice this stuff for people that may have interest in an item so that they can watch this whole process and not just the last two minutes of it. Um, and I don't, maybe there's a good way to do that. Maybe we got to get our heads together and figure out how to do that. Um, it's the same thing with the planning commission. As soon as the sign goes up, then people get worried. Well, even when the sign comes up, people don't get worried. It's when the excavator shows up on the property and it's too late then. And it's the kind of, it's, it's inherent in the process. It's not really that, uh, and I, I wish that we could have more relevant input earlier from, from stakeholders. Um, I, I did not want to snub anybody by by planet or by a pacifist today. However, I, I still don't. I mean, we've been dealing with this for coming up on a year, maybe. I don't know when we first started this, but a long time ago. And uh, I, I, I seriously, uh, my comment earlier was, I don't think two weeks is going to change the commentary, because of the complexity of an RDA. You didn't learn about RDAs in, in two weeks. Neither did I. And so, and, and that's probably where the concern is, is, is the confusion of how an RDA works. Um, I'm happy that Brandon is gonna, gonna do a, an educational piece on how these CRAs actually work, how they function and what they don't do. I think that's probably as important as, as what they do do. Um, and, you know, to kind of go off the, the comments that we received, you know, no, you can't tiff the whole town because, you know, it, it, it doesn't justify it. But if, uh, if you've got a, a, an area that will not develop organically, that's what these things are for, is, is to inflect some, inject some cash or some, some value, some money into these things so that they can then develop and then return that tax increment to the cities at some uh, some future point. Um, so so no, you can't make the whole city an RDA. That that, that does not work, and then nobody's re you know proposing that we do. Um, and that's why I kind of make the comment. Let's not make st statements that just confuse. I think it's I think we need to be talking about things that are real, and I and I think we've tried to do that as a council. And, and uh, Brandon's tried to do that. He's been very open, so for what that's worth. Do you have a comment, board member White? Do you have a comment? Well, I have a follow-up, but you? Yeah, I don't have a follow-up. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilman Rahayer. I, I, I appreciate your comments, and thank you for uh, acknowledging that, you know, we might you know, we might need to look at at how we do this a little bit more. Um, and you know, I, I, as I just sit here and think about these, I I, I just feel like we're 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 at such a at a, such a disadvantage as a council member as council members as a city council where we do this part time. Right, and we've tried in the past to improve our uh, our processes and and you know and the way we interact with, pub with the public and 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 we, we we've we've done a lot of things to try to uh, and we've done some changes we've done a few changes uh, but it's hard and I, I understand that it's hard uh, but uh, like I said I, it's not impossible and I was even thinking as I'm sitting here. Um, you know, technology is very advanced, and I'm even thinking, giving people a chance. Maybe, maybe we should figure out a way, and you know, they can interact with us with a, with an iPad or or with their cell phones and ask us questions and watch them live and put them on Facebook. And as as this is happening, just to to be able to see and hear somehow, let them feel that we care about what they're saying, and that you know, that's that's. Uh, that's what weighs heavy on me, and it may sound insignificant, and I know that we can't always make everyone happy, and we will never, never make everybody happy, 
but uh, I just wonder how hard we've tried to improve our our process. I wonder how hard we tried. Um, I think I think we do better than other bodies uh, because I I know that we're not even required legally to take public input. I know that I've heard that, and so I I think I think. I think there's really good will happening, and so um, you know, I'm just, I'm just personally with maybe with me, I'm just a little frustrated, and maybe it's even related to my introspective uh, analysis of me not running for council again, you know, and 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 these nostalgic thoughts may be coming out here in the few coming weeks. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to. I want to follow up a little bit on um, something that um, was said tonight about the the best practices. Um, I, I wish everybody would read that report um, because I would I would challenge anyone to look at that report and and actually say that our group is not doing exactly what that report is requiring. Um, transparency, trying to explained tonight a very complicated process. Every time that, that, that CED comes in front of us, it's, it's trying to explain a very, very difficult process. Uh, financial evaluations and fiscal evaluations. Uh, if you read the packet, uh, you can see there are spreadsheets that are like this. I mean, you have to get out your magnifying glass in order to read these spreadsheets. Um, and, and the reporting. Uh, Every year we have to have a report. Every year we, we have a reporting system. So I would, um, I would challenge um, that we are doing best practices. And I would really challenge people. If, if you want this report, I will send it to you. I have it. Um, so just reach out to me. But I do not agree with some of the statements that were made tonight about this report. And so um, I'd love to have a conversation with anyone about it. Just real quick, and I, and you know I, I hope that as we have an opportunity to inter interact with each other, um, that the dialogue can continue. And if the, if we vote on something and it doesn't go your way, that you don't feel like you you weren't heard. You know we we are listening. Um, it also occurred to me that I mean very rarely does something come to this agenda today where it hasn't gone through a work session, and there's been a full open discussion and presentation and additional details. And and we have that technology. We've got those meetings recorded. We have the packets available to download and, and read through and, and try to understand as well. And, and, and any time, if at any point in time during that you have questions, you can email any member of the council. You can reach out to us. And I, I do hope that that process, yeah, it could probably be, there's things that we could probably do better. Um, but I do think we have tools that are available that maybe you're just overlooked or maybe aren't, people aren't aware that they are there. So it might take a little bit of digging, but I think we do a pretty good job of even highlighting in the meeting it when certain things are talked about, or at least if you follow the agenda, you can kind of skip through and see, see through. And then I've also heard you can listen to it like two times speed, so you don't have to listen <laughs> to me that. speaking like this. You can listen to me speaking like Mickey Mouse or something else. So anyway, but I do appreciate people that come and express their concerns and, and get engaged because it, it's, it, it does show that you care. Yeah, agreed. Well, the only thing I would say to follow up is I fully agree with you, um, I guess Board Member Lopez in this meeting, um, and that's something we've talked about before that I think is so challenging, is when people see public hearing on the agenda, they think that is the time to come and mm -hmm. say something. I mean, that's what it looks like. If you're a person that's not in touch with you know, all of our processes, that's when I would think I was supposed to come to express my concern. So I think that is a huge issue that I wouldn't have had a problem delaying a little bit because it's just our process is weird. You know, that's just how it is. Um, but I'm absolutely always available to go visit with constituents. I do it with other council members or with other staff members or just on my own so people have questions. We try to be responsive. Sometimes emails do slip through, um, but we're happy to meet and talk with people too. So that's all I wanted to say. Hey, can we adjourn? Motion Second. to adjourn. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I suggest we take a 10 minute break only, 10 minutes. Come right back here for our next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.
Do I have to hit this again? Okay, everybody, thanks for that break. Welcome to the June 6, 2026 City Council meeting. Please let the record reflect that all council members are present with the exception of Council Member Nadolski. Um, first up, we have the common consent agenda. Chair, we can I, can I uh, make a motion that we pull item uh, 2A for a presentation and exclude it from the common consent? You bet. I'll make that motion. Anybody like to second that motion? Item 2A. Second, also pull it or, or, or have a presentation. Presentation. Yep, just for the presentation. That's all. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. do it differently, but this will work too. So we've got a second from second. Here. Yeah, so we have a motion by council member High, sec higher, second by vice chair Richie to pull the enterprise fund transfer item off of the consent agenda for a presentation. And we invite Glenn, Glenn Symes, our deputy. Do we have to vote? Oh, yeah, well, I guess we have to vote. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks. <laughs> okay, it Glenn. Is now you're up. I'm sorry. Get no a little problem. sleepy. I'd like to point out that just before I spoke again, you guys all went eight. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Then no, you're getting a whole, you make us hungry. Let's get a whole I know, I don't conspiracy know what yeah. theory here, right? and I apologize about I'm just, that. I'm just giving you a hard time. No big deal at all. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. So, normally um, we don't have presentations for uh, common consent items, but uh, given that um, this particular item and this public hearing and this notice generally um, creates a lot of questions and issues, it's probably really appropriate that we have more than one. So I'm happy to be here and, and talk about this. So um, uh, as you can see on the agenda, uh, there's an option for you all to uh, sort of formally set the public hearing for a proposed enterprise fund transfer from the water, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, and refuse utility enterprise funds to the general fund. And uh, this is a transfer that has been done for many, many years, uh, decades. Um, I think uh, our finance folks have, have done some research every time we, we change um, uh, accounting software. Sometimes you lose a little bit. The, as far back as they can go to easily tell, I think, is, is around 19, uh, behind the pillar, I think around 1994-ish. So it's been at least 30 years. So it's, it's been a while. So the, the transfer itself is not new. However, about five or six years ago, there was a change to state law that required us to send a letter uh, to everybody, uh, or notice at least, to, to all the users of the enterprise fund um, if uh, a transfer like this is to take place. So this letter is the, only, only you can see it since I'm not on camera, thankfully, right now. Uh, but it is a letter that went out to every um, utility user. Uh, it's about 26 or 27,000 people in the city uh, that received that letter, uh, letting them know about this public hearing on the 20th. Um, so the transfer is not new. The noticing requirements and the public hearing are new. So that's the new part. So as I mentioned, these are enterprise funds. And uh, for people not familiar with enterprise funds, um, an enterprise fund is a, is a separate government account uh, that is meant to fund itself through fees or charges for services. So Ogden City has nine of these enterprise funds, four of which are these utility funds. Um, so the transfer itself uh, is done for a couple of different reasons. Um, first is that the city uh, tries to treat each of these utilities as they were as though they were a separate non-city utility um, So the city does receive both property tax and franchise tax from Rocky Mountain Power and Dominion Energy uh, So sort of a, as, a, as an accounting method uh, as a way to treat these utilities equally to non-city utilities the city charges uh, or assesses uh, these four utilities what would be a franchise tax or a property tax um, and since, uh, as I mentioned, the, the enterprise funds are meant to support themselves, this helps to reflect the, the true cost of, of doing business if these were separate non-city utilities. Um, the second reason is that uh, these transfers uh, are a way to help non-property tax paying entities contribute to the general fund. Um, if this uh, transfer were to not take place, uh, this year's is proposed to be a maximum amount of about $6.3 million. If this were not to take place, uh, the city would either have to reduce uh, general fund uh, uh, expenses accordingly uh, or would have to replace revenue somewhere else. And uh, the most likely source and really the only source we could get that kind of money is through property taxes. Uh, and of course, if that were to happen, then the non-tax paying properties 
uh, would not be assessed that increase. So it goes from utility bills to property taxes. Um, tax exempt properties would not uh, share in that uh, in that offset. So for uh, all properties, regardless of their property tax status, do pay a water bill uh, if they have an account with the city. Uh, so this is a way to help all the properties uh, contribute to the cost of the general fund services uh, that are in fact available to all residents. So this includes police, fire, accounting, engineering, planning, uh, all of those things uh, that go into general fund. So this is a way to, to kind of broaden the base a little bit. So as I mentioned, uh, the action tonight is not the actual public hearing. The public hearing is on the 20th. Um, this is just to formally set the public hearing. And uh, for those who cannot make the 20th, uh, or would prefer not to attend uh, on the 20th, uh, we do have some options uh, for folks to reach out to you all as council members. Uh, they can send a, uh, an email to citycouncil at ogdencity.com, where they can call the council office at 801-629-8153 if they want to leave comments. And generally, we get a handful of uh, emails and phone calls right around this time. As this say, say that again. Where, where can sure. You? Sorry. Uh, so the email is citycouncil at ogdencity.com, and the council office number is area code 801-629-8153. And that letter that you mentioned that people couldn't see is in the packet, so if anybody Correct. needs to reference it, if they didn't get it in the mail for some reason, um, they can look in the packet under this item. Yes. Thanks, Glenn. You bet. Any questions for me? Any other questions? No questions. See any. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'd be happy then to take a motion to pass the common consent. Well, I guess this item is off the common consent now. So, would anybody like to make a motion on this item? Chair, I'll make a motion on uh, resolution 2023 15 to adopt that. Second. Or is that the public hearing? Just set the public June 20th. Hearing. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, we have a motion by Councilmember Heyer, second by Councilmember White to set the public hearing for June 20th, 2023 for the Enter Enterprise Fund transfer. Um, this is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I was waiting for Jason to say it since he's been doing it all night. But anyway, um, next. Chair, item. I would make a motion that we accept the common consent item of the proposed ordinance adopting or 2023, uh, setting a public hearing for adopt, approving the capital improvement plan. And setting a public hearing for June 20th. And setting a public hearing for June 20th. Sounds good. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion by Vice Chair Ritchie and a second by Council Member Blair to set the public hearing for June 20th, 2023. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And thanks again, Glenn, for doing that presentation. Up next, um, we actually have a public hearing for the proposed fiscal year 2023 to 24 budget. We're going to have the presentation on all three items by Janine Eller Smith, our Executive Director of the City Council. Thank you, Chair Jaburka. I'm happy to be here. Um, as you know, we set this public hearing a couple of weeks ago, and this is on the tentative budget. Uh, by state law, you are required to adopt a tentative budget. So I'm, um, we go through the budget preparation. I reviewed this a couple of weeks ago, but we do interviews with council members. I make the presentation to uh, the mayor administration about your priorities. We also review the financial pr principles and guidelines. Uh, we didn't do any updates to those these year, no changes, and updates to the goals, which we are completing during the budget process and will become part of the final budget document. One thing that um, I do when I make the presentation to the mayor and the, and the and directors is I provide them with um, a presentation guideline. And you might have noticed that a lot of the presentations, uh, most of the, the presentations by the directors follow those guidelines. So we've asked them to you know, highlight their accomplishments, you know, any cost-saving measures or efficiencies that they have throughout the, adopted throughout the year, challenges, you know, short-term, long-term, and then specific funding issues that relate to um, you know, line item in increases, uh, CIP projects, major equipment purchases, and things like that. And then also maybe to highlight goals. And we felt we made this change a few years ago to sort of focus more on the policy issues that are that come forth through the budget rather than every single line item in the budget. 
Luckily, um, there's no proposed property tax increase. Um, so it, just a couple of highlights from the tentative budget. It provides employee cost of living increases 1% and then 4% merit for those who qualify. Uh, there are nine new positions. Those are that met. There's actually 11 new, but two are um, to replace existing positions. They had insurance increase of 11%, but that's going to be covered by the city, so that cost is not being passed on to the employees. So that's a a good benefit for the employees because that's about eight hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars that the city is picking up. The general plan update about a million dollars, seven hundred fifty thousand for a consultant and two hundred and fifty for some part time people to assist um, in the office as that that's tra uh, transpiring. Uh, Union Station property purchase, or I'm sure everybody's really happy to see this happen. Uh, $780,000, that's the first year of a seven years payment plan. Um, and then Swift Environmental, fi finally finishing that up and kind of getting square with the EPA. And Recreation Improvement, $750,000, this is to kind of develop the 4th Street Park into um, a, rec a larger rec recreational facility, sports, sports facility. Um, this shows the year-over-year -year comparisons. You can see that the, in the increase uh, of the budget over from 24 over 23 is 4.7%. Um, that year-to-date is, is the budget, not, ne not necessarily expenditures. It's not expenditures. Um, and the changes in that from the adopted to the year-to-date are generally carryover or maybe some additional grants that come into the general fund. As you know, uh, finance doesn't recognize the revenue from the grants until we actually receive it. Here's the year-over-year year budget comparisons for all funds. Uh, it's showing the total uh, city budget, $253,920,000. Uh, which is just less than a half percent increase over um, the 2023 20, adopted. Here's the staffing changes in the general fund. Um, prosecutors are asking for a couple of people, a, a new assistant prosecutor and a legal assistant, uh, an additional person in fiscal ops, um, a lieutenant and a sergeant in um, Police department, those are going to be related to school resource, and then also another police officer will be uniform patrol. Uh, fire's asking for a captain who will uh, do uh, training, uh, and then public services, uh, they're asking for a crew leader, leader at Linquist Field and a refuse collector uh, for at the parks. And then there's two non general fund uh, staffing changes, they're asking for a position in risk to manage the insurance claims, and um, also another firefighter in the medical fund. So that's a total of 11 new positions, which are eliminating two positions. There were also five reclassifications and three title changes. Um, this is the wage and benefit cost, just to show how much that 5% increase costs the city. It's you know, $4 million across all funds. Um, that's <clears throat> this shows general fund salaries and benefits as a co as a total, um, and basically, the general fund seventy two percent of the general fund is salaries and benefits, and of that seventy two percent of the general fund, seventy two percent of that is for police, fire, and public services. So a lot of you know is heavily uh, goes towards uh, employee salaries and benefits. One of the things uh, <clears throat> that uh, Councilmember White asked for, um, and directors were uh, ha happy to provide, was what would an impact of 5% or 10% reductions do to their operations? And all of them said um, a 5% or 10% reduction is going to impact staffing, and, and that also leads to service level impacts. So in public services, you know, even just a 5%, that means they'd have to eliminate Make a Difference Day, which is a huge, huge thing in the city. The golf tournament that they do for the 
partners uh, that the city has uh, for all kinds of things that happen in the city, homeless cleanup. Um, Ten percent, that means that, and this is just an administration, they'd have to eliminate a full-time position. Engineering could end up with capital projects being delayed um, and reduction in staff. And recreation, I thought this was significant. Um, even just with a 5% decrease, they'd have to reduce the hours of the pool, reduce the hours at uh, golden hours. They might have to eliminate dogged and untamed and reduce uh, equipment purchases, which they provide to coaches. So really would impact um, the kids as well. You know, same for 10%, that basically they'd have to be eliminating classes at golden hours and they might lose the jazz affiliation because they couldn't afford the, the uniforms that are required. This is the most significant uh, for police and fire. 5% uh, reduction in police would be 11 full-time employees. 10% would be 21. Uh, in fire, uh, about the same. 20, 11 and a half firefighters, that's four per day, so it's basically a shift. And 10% budget reduction would be 23 firefighters. So that would mean they'd probably have to close stations. That would increase response times by six to 10 minutes. We've already have an issue with turnover, especially in the fire department and, and work, workload overload. Um, I thought just, I've done this in the, in the past and hadn't done this this year. So I thought I would just do a little bit of research today um, and kind of looked at some of our sister cities to see where we might compare on sort of a per capita basis. Um, in, and again, this is general fund. So compared to Salt Lake City, we have 43% of, of their population and only 29% of their budget. Um, we pay, we spend $685 uh, for each uh, resident and Salt Lake pays about $1,000, so we're about 32% less than, than what Salt Lake City is, is expending on behalf of their residents. They do have a higher uh, daytime um, population, which I'm sure impacts their, their budget quite a bit. Sandy, kind of the same comparisons. We, are, we have 91% of their um, population, but only 78% of their budget. Uh, and we spend about 14% less per capita than they do in Sandy. Um, in Provo, which actually we were pretty close to, 76% um, of their population, but 73% of their budget, um, we're just a little bit under 4% less than what they pay per capita. The five-year strategic plan, uh, we've stressed um, with the administration that we that you want this to be sort of a guiding document and they've been uh, really good at pointing out where their their direct their uh, goals align with the with the primary directive and the and the initiatives in the strategic plan um, the council budget goals and the strategic in initiatives outlined in that five-year plan economic development, community develop, community safety, recreation, city image and reputation, and then council added fiscal sustainability and transparency. I thought it was interesting that a lot of in this, when we went through this process uh, to establish the strategic plan, it was obvious um, that everything that was in the strategic plan are things that the city is already doing. We just haven't done a very good job of telling people how we do those. Um, and so they're just busy doing the work instead of, instead of trying to tell people about what they're doing. So this is a capital improvement plan projects. Um, this is just BDO lease revenue uh, that's being put towards those. Um, the Union Station is something we discussed, $205,000 for that. Um, and the fire facility maintenance. $300,000, uh, there's another 2.3 million on top of that from the medical fund. So this $5 million, again, is just from BDO lease revenue. There's another, um, let's see, $23 million um, that come from other sources uh, that could be um, 
uh, the utilities, their fund balance, or uh, uh, other grants or other things. So, you know, a total of 28 million in CIP projects that are proposed in the budget. What's not in the budget, at least right now, um, there is a million dollars for uh, Marshall White, but, but that's it. And we know that uh, we're close to going to the bond market. Um, they're still talking about the timing on that. They thought they might do it this week, but there's some discussion about waiting another week. Um, so that $23, $24 million that they're going to bond for um, will probably come, is coming in a, a budget amendment for the current year. That was hot off the presses this afternoon. Um, central business district parking structures, those will happen. Bonding for that will happen later in the year. And then that Ogden Canyon water line is 87 to $90 million project. They're still trying to find funding options for that. So there's no Schedule A changes tonight. So what you're adopting in the tentative budget is what was proposed by the mayor. Um, in the Schedule A-1, uh, the administration is requested to add some additional ramp funding of $363,650 to increase that A-1. If you want additional funds added and to the budget, uh, we need to have that direction by June 8th so that we can get, get it noticed. We, if we notice the number, uh, you can always adopt something less than what you noticed, but you can't go higher. So here's the budget process that we've gone through. You've had uh, five work sessions. Um, and so that's 14 hours just of meeting time. I know you've all spent hours individually going through the budget. Um, and then, of course, countless hours on administrative and staff time um, to get you to this point. So the actions before you tonight are to uh, adopt the tentative budget as required by state law and then set the public hearing on the final budget and the salary schedules for June 20th, uh, 2023. Thanks so much, Janine. Any questions or comments from council? <clears throat> None right this moment. So we will be opening the public hearing on this item. Um, you can step to the podium and you have three minutes to speak after you state your name for the record. And if you're online on the Zoom meeting, you can raise your hand there. Welcome. Travis Pate. Uh, primarily, I just want to echo the comment from the public, uh, three, from the uh, end of la the last meeting, which is uh, the budget for the general plan with and just carte blanche no accountability for the current general plan um, and then also the dynamic we talked it was mentioned that there's electronic aspects so i think just putting another getting another paper plan that's on the shelf versus seeing what's interactive on a general plan the riverfront redevelopment project area has more protections than the established neighborhoods so we continue to give scrape and rebuild more protections than we do our, our existing infrastructure. So what incentive are we providing for people to stay in Ogden? What incentives are we providing for the Make Ogden Plan, which has a big historic element, and we're just going to back burner that again because it's easier to just land bank. Let's take the East Central Community Plan and, and just scrap it because there's we're going to encroach the central business district into downtown, up into the residential area. We, you just approved six stories on the Desert Gym block, and yet, hmm, let's look at that, the Weber Academy block. We didn't provide any protections for historic infrastructure. From the library, I can now see this beautiful sunset from the second floor. Boom, as soon as that six-story building goes up in the inner block, even though the East Central Community Plan and the General Plan says do not put large structures on the inner blocks, but nope, you guys approved it as just a line item from Planning Commission that said, oh, here's one other minor change. A minor change? Two extra stories to a, to a building in, on a historic block? And yet, are we going to give the other opportunities? I mean, it's just, it's just the view corridor and vista preservation that's already in the current general plan. No accountability for that. 
It's just, it's fairly frustrating, uh, and also to be told dismissively that, individ that there were things convoluting the meeting or the agenda. No, it was simple questions. I didn't see anything convoluting. And so I think when I read the banner on the way in that says, don't show disrespect, I believe one of the members' comments was fairly disrespectful back to the community. And, and so I, I just don't know how we're supposed to continue to come here, to continue to actually ask requests, and to continue to say, hey, can we look and fine tune this? Oh yeah, but now, like the CRA at the airport, boom, we have no leverage from you guys now. It's passed. So there's no reason for them to have any accountability back to other partners other than good faith. And I would appreciate and hope that there's good faith. I was told by one individual in administration that, oh, I'll contact you about historic preservation and some research. It's been almost a year and a half. So, so the accountability side of things to me has to come back to you also. Thank you. So budget the city council funding for general plan, but don't let them have it yet. Have, they have to come back. Thank you, Janice. Any other comments? Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. It's going to be a long one, huh? 924. You should have snacks. Um, I echo a lot of uh, Travis's concerns. I also echo the fact that every single year we have the ritual where I come before you and I ask for more money for our first responders. And um, every single department is going to tell you if you ask them for a 5% or a 10% budget, they're, they're going to tell you that they're not going to be able to do it because if they could do it, they would. That's what consultants are brought in for or that's what the power of y'all makes happen. You have control over the budget. You have control over the laws. And if you keep saying that first responders are critical to you and you keep saying that fire is important and police department is important, then well, put your money where your mouth is. You know, I mean, the responsibility of a city is utilities and services. That's first and foremost. And the whole thing with... Um, accountability for economic development projects, whether or not they pencil, they don't all pencil. Some work and some work great. And some of the ones that work great are the ones that Mayor Godfrey did. Mayor Godfrey kept this city from being bankrupt with the BDO. If we didn't have the BDO, we would be in a whole lot of trouble. And so I'm not saying that absolutely every single, every single thing that CED does is bad. But I'm also saying that you, you don't exercise your legislative powers accordingly to fund the things that you say are important to you, like police and fire. If you really and truly wanted to make sure that public safety was what it's supposed to be and you would make sure that you would do whatever you can to give them the budget that they need. And again, I go back to COVID when we cut the budget by $7 million and no services were cut. Nobody was laid off and nobody was fired. And to take seven million out of a budget to right size it because we didn't know what was going to happen with our commercial tax base. I mean, that was a great move. We did what we were supposed to do, but seven million should be alarming to you. And, and I encourage you to take the opportunity when you approve budgets to use your power to prioritize what's important to you, your city. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm not seeing any hands online. Oh, there's one. Go ahead, Heath Sato. Hey, um, thanks for staying so late with us and thanks for letting us comment. I know you legally do not have to. Uh, take public comments. Um, just real quick, I, when we're comparing our budget to other cities, I would like to see us compare apples with apples as best as we can. I don't think comparing our budget to a city the size of Salt Lake um, makes sense. And that's not to 
come down on anyone that made that choice. I, I just think we can we can find better examples. There are better examples. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? There's like three other people. Okay. Great. Awesome. Would anybody like to close the public hearing? So you know I'd make a motion to close the public hearing on this. Second. Okay. A motion by Vice Chair Ritchie. Second by Council Member Hired to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Any other discussion or would anybody like to make a motion? I, uh, I'd like to make a motion awesome. that we uh, adopt the ten, uh, proposed ordinance 2023 adopting the uh, dash 28 adopting the proposed tentative budget. Seriously, it's after nine, you guys. We've got a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. I feel like I'm suddenly an auctioneer. Okay. Um, we have a motion by Council Member White, a second by Council Member Blair to adopt proposed ordinance 2023-28. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Blair? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Chair, I make a motion we set a public hearing for June 20th, 2023 for proposed ordinance 2023-29, adopting the budget for the fiscal year. Second. I have a motion by, by Vice Chair Ritchie, a second by Council Member Heyer to set the public hearing for June 20th, 2023 um, for proposed ordinance 2023-29. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passes. Chair, I'd make a motion that we uh, set the public hearing for June 20th uh, concerning ordinance 2023-30. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Heyer, a second from Councilmember Blair to set the public hearing for June 20th, 2023 for proposed ordinance 2023-30. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thanks so much for your presentation, Janine. Up next, and he's waited all night <laughs> till 9.30, <Yeah. laughs> is Chief Matthew, our Ogden Fire Chief, to talk with us about the extension of the state of emergency. Thank Don't let you. him kid you. He got several naps sitting back there. Okay, thank you so much for waiting. <laughs> council Member Chair Chaburka and Council Members, thank you. I know it's been long, so I'll be brief. Um, the extension request is because it's required by ordinance and state law that, that the mayor has the authority to declare for up to a period of 30 days and in order to extend it needs the support of the city council the purpose of extending the state of emergency is not necessarily because we're still in a significant response phase to flooding or spring runoff we're really now moving towards the recovery phase and under the recovery phase in order for us to maintain our eligibility for potentially state and federal assistance, we need to go through a process of doing what they call the preliminary damage assessment reports. And that, that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, currently, the state has asked as of yesterday for us to submit those and they're due next Monday. So we have to put a whole lot of work into it over the next week just to kind of look at a size up of what kind of damage we have suffered through our waterways, predominantly streams and creeks, and then the rivers throughout the city and what the restoration work or recovery work is necessary. And so we're going to have to try to quantify that, get that in there, and there will be still follow-up opportunities to um, identify those issues, but we, we want to remain under a state of a, a condition of emergency in order to do the recovery phase. The state of Utah and the governor has declared, I think through August 15th for the state being under a state of emergency and so we want to just uh, uh, declare for that same period of time so we can collect all the information and data and submit it to the county and state to determine if down the road we're eligible for any type of federal assistance for restoration of public infrastructure. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> See no questions. Thanks Chief. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you. Chair, I'd make a motion we adopt proposed resolution. Unless there's conversation. Proposed resolution 2023-16. Second. We have a motion by Vice Chair Ritchie and a second by Council Member Heyer to adopt proposed resolution 2023-16, authorizing the extension of state of emergency. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Blair? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. 
Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you again for staying so late. Chief, if he's still back there. He's there like, he I'm out of here. Okay, another person that stayed late with us this evening is uh, Brandon Cooper, our Director of Community Economic Development, to talk with us about the Airport Community Reinvestment Area Plan. Hey, we're all late together. <clears throat> So thank you for your time. Um, I'll be uh, brief. In the previous meeting, um, you all acting as the redevelopment agency adopted the, uh, how does this work? There we go. Uh, you adopted the uh, airport continental um, reinvestment project area plan and budget. And uh, by virtue of state statute, we're required to also uh, adopt that by ordinance in, on the city council side. So uh, tonight before you is two um, res. Yep, two resolutions, um, one Thank for you. the project area plan and the other for the uh, interlocal agreement between the RDA and Ogden City. Uh, just, to, just for the record, um, I do want to highlight uh, what was adopted by the RDA and what you are being asked to adopt by ordinance in, on the city side. Uh, this is a 25-year uh, project <laughs> area with a base valuation of a little over $211 <laughs> million. Bless you. Thank you. Um, the maximum budget for the project area is a, a little over $119 million. Uh, we do have a 5% set aside for admin and a 20% set aside for housing. We're participating with uh, uh, four taxing entities um, subject to uh, the action here tonight. Uh, one is the county, the school district, uh, the sewer district, and then um, the Ogden City. And so for Ogden City's participation related to the Ogden City Interlocal Agreement, the max participation would be 95% um, or $28 million, whichever comes first within that 25-year period. So it's our recommendation uh, to follow suit from the RDA and as the city adopt Ordinance 2023-31 uh, for the Project Area Plan and Resolution 2013-14 for the Interlocal Agreement. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering, there was a comment made earlier that the current economic development director at Weber County was not in agreement with this plan. Is that the case? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <coughs> we worked through her and her economic development uh, committee to um, adjust the final interlocal agreement. It was um, her submission to the county commissioners uh, for final approval. She actually read it into the minutes and uh, acted on my behalf because I was double booked, so I wasn't able to be there. Um, so I can't speak to that comment. All I know is that she was integral in helping us getting it passed. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Brandon. Cool. Thank you. Any other discussion? Would anybody like to propose a motion? Chair, I'd make a motion that we adopt uh, resolution 2023-14. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Blair to adopt proposed resolution 2023-14. This Be is a roll call vote. Before we vote, oh. Chair, can I? Yes. Um, so I think there was a comment made in the last uh, the last meeting, whatever meeting we were in. Um, I just I encourage you to, to reach out. It looked like you followed um, a lot of those individuals out. Um, but uh, again, making sure that you follow up with the advisory committee. And, and so I, I would appreciate that as well. All right, thank you. Council member Heyer. Aye. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Blair? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you. Chair, I'd also make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 2023-31. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Heyer, a second by Vice Chair Ritchie to adopt proposed Ordinance 2023-31. This is also a roll call vote. Councilmember Lopez? 
Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Blair? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you. Any comments from the administration? Nothing else tonight. Thank you. Any other comments from council members? I just have a really quick comment and I'll make it fast. Uh, this past weekend was uh, the Salt Lake uh, City Pride Festival. And I know, um, again, I, I, I wore my rainbow jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to, again, emphasize that <coughs> if there is anybody in need of uh, talking or feeling like they are not uh, worthy, I, I would... It, 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 people need to reach out, please do so, and I'm sure that uh, all of my council members would do the same as far as listening and getting help, but uh, the youth in our, our state uh, have a pretty high suicide rate, and um, it's just not, it's just not right, so. Anyway. Sure. Did you have a comment? Oh, I, I, did. I thought nope. I heard you move toward breathed. the buzzer. Okay, no breathing allowed. No. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I just want to say that even though many of you may think otherwise, I'm not crazy. My seemingly contradictory votes oh, no. were because uh, I am not opposed to RDAs. I support RDAs. I think they've done really good for our city. But I had some concerns with the process and engaging with our citizens when they come and talk to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Motion to adjourn. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. I'm like, I can't remember what I'm supposed to say.